All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is November 12th, 2023. And as promised, I am going to get into the Apocryphas. It'd be a great segue from the last video. And I'd been talking about doing this for a while now, uh, uh, for a few months that I would get to it. And so today, we're not going to go into absolutely every detail of a bunch of Apocryphas. But we are going to touch on seven, that's right, seven different portions of seven different, uh, uh, different portions of seven different apocryphas. So some of them very simple, very straightforward, just a couple things here and there, a couple of them, many more detailed. You know, we just recently touched on Polycarp, so we're not going to do much there except add some, some points to it. Uh, in relation to to a group prepared and watching beforehand, uh, it's it's really wild stuff. I was preparing for it this afternoon, <clears throat> and and as I had finished going through these things, making sure I was hitting the points I want in each book, you know, I was done and I went to have dinner and I just looked at my wife and I'm like, man, it's crazy to have these revelations to be able to understand what we've been blessed to understand you know it is an absolute truth it is an absolute fact ministry revealed we have been given the understanding of the open books this is the group that needed to come according to to the the community of a group that was here before christ as watchmen ready for when christ was coming you're going to see a little clip of this a little bit later there was this group of watchmen, like the Essenes, where the Dead Sea Scrolls come from, where the community and the teacher of righteousness and all of this group came from, the original 14thers. It's, it's all connected, and I'm going to show you some incredible stuff. I was talking with our brother uh, John Van Horn earlier this week, and, and it dawned on me something as I was talking to him, and we were going back and forth and sharing some things, and it dawned on me something that always came before the next portion from the was to the is to the is to come and it's mind-blowing it is absolutely mind-blowing to know that we are a part of it i'm not saying we are all of it we are a part of it and it's it's wild i'm not going to share everything that i went to digging into this because I think most people wouldn't be able to accept it, to be honest with you. But I can tell you right now, we are a people being prepared of that. There is zero doubt. It's it's fascinating. It's exciting. And it begins to make more and more sense. If you've been around at least for a little while and you understand this revelation of the 14 years and the open books and and what that has revealed along the way within Scripture and without Scripture, from from apocryphas and what it revealed historically to how it relates to the future it's it's so incredible it, it's exactly what what um uh uh, uh ecclesiastes 1 9 always says what was shall be what is shall be there's nothing new under the sun there was a group of people in the beginning there's a there was a group of people right before christ and there's a group of people right before the end of days begins the was, the is, and the is to come. And I can promise you, we are a part of that. So we will continue to strengthen each other. We will continue to pick each other up, support each other, bless each other, pray over each other, and do everything we can to keep sharing it, to keep uplifting, to keep strengthening the body, and doing everything we can within our power to be able to continue to make these things happen. So with that, that's what we're really going to get into seven apocryphas guys we're going to touch on tonight but before i do i figured i'm going to start with giving people an understanding of why or where i believe things are going to happen and i don't want to spend too much time but i want to make sure i cover it and one of the things is like going to this chart that we have okay why do we start it in 1950 to 1951 and what this means this is from Feast of Trumpets at the beginning to the last day of the year, the following year, which is Elul 29. And then this would be the next day, Feast of Trumpets 1951 to Elul 29, the final day of the year. This would be Feast of Trumpets 1952. 
okay, and so on and so forth. Why did we do that when Israel came into the land in May of 1948, okay? What, what caused this gap in events and, of course, what we've taught on in the past with the Leviticus 19 that allows us to say Feast of Trumpets 1954 to 1955 Feast of Trumpets or Elul 29 the day before was the very first year that the Lord granted it to be theirs, okay? So I want to cover this with you briefly so that new people can grasp it and people that have been around, I've seen some questions because, you know, we haven't been talking about the, the, the two 70s. We've been talking about the, the last 70 that, that comes at the, end of, at the end of the tribulation, at the end of 13 years being accomplished. But we haven't spent too much time here. So what I want to do is we're going to go into this. I'm going to break it down briefly so everybody can be on the same page and understand it. And then we're going to go into these apocryphas. And <laughs> you're going to see the truth is the truth. The revelation is 14 years. And I, I, I almost forgot. I want to let everybody know ahead of time that we did not go to Apocryphus. I never went to Apocryphus first and tried to figure out what was being revealed and then went to Scripture to try to prove it. That never once ever happened, not even one single time. It was always revealed through Scripture first. And then brothers and sisters and sometimes myself were watching and we're understanding, and we're digging and discerning these things, and then they go and read in the Apocryphas, and they're doing other studies, and bam, they see something, and they share it with the ministry. I go in and review it, look through it, and oh my goodness, have we ever found some crazy good things. You see, if it was just me, that would be one thing, but we're talking about hundreds and even a few thousand people that are understanding and finding these things and sharing them as well. All right. It is the truth. And it is a people prepared. They are watchmen. All right. Are there other watchmen that don't know what we know? Absolutely. Are they watching for this time at the end? Absolutely. But are they 14 or watchmen? No, not all of them. They most of them come against us, but it doesn't mean they're not watchmen. They just haven't received the revelation of the end of days. And like I said, I'm not going to go into parts that get really deep and heavy in the study of this, in, in, in other sections of it, because you come to read that the end of days could not begin. This is from documents from 2,100 years ago in the, in the uh, Qumran scrolls, in the, in the Apocryphas that were found, that until... This group, a group, was revealed the understanding of the open books, the prophets, and so forth, to reveal the understanding of the end of days, which the church had been confused in until that time. The end of days and the time of the end could not be yet at hand. <laughs> I was freaking out last night. I was reading this stuff, and then I went on to for an hour rant with my wife, just unloading it all on her. And she just be in tears, you know, because it is crazy that we are a part of this for some reason. We can accept it now. We've seen it. We understand it. Now we just continue and continue to dig and to draw closer and closer and closer until that time begins. And so that's what I'm going to go into with these, this 70 year so that everybody can see what I'm talking about and why. For anybody that's new to the ministry... Come to this playlist right here or go to the Ministry Revealed uh, website and go to the intro series. In here, there's 12 videos. And on the intro series on the website, there might be 10 or so videos. Watch the first four videos if you're new to the ministry. Watch the first four videos of this playlist. You're going to see the first one is an introduction. It's only 22 minutes, and it's an introduction to what the next three will, sh will talk about. The next two videos are 30-minute Bible studies. That's it. The first one is a 30-minute Bible study to begin to reveal to you that the differences that have been in the Gospels, that in the Synoptic Gospels in particular of Matthew, Mark, Luke, reveal these things that were contradictions that people couldn't really understand for centuries. They're not contradictions. They're prophecy. 
They are all prophecy riddled throughout the Gospels. It is the revelation of the differences in the Gospels. These differences are prophecy. And you will see that Luke, Mark, and Matthew is the way it plays out in the end. You will notice that the discourses are different for a reason, and it's the revelation of the end of days. It goes Luke, Mark, Matthew. You're going to see that pre, mid, and post are all true. They're all true. And it's in the revelation of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, above and then 14 years. The above portion is Luke. The Mark portion is seven years of seals. And the Matthew portion is seven years of trumpets. It is the revelation of 14 years. And this is why it's so fascinating when we talk about 14ers. And I've been calling us 14ers for almost six years now as just a little thing I did because of the 14-year revelation. And then we came to find out that there were actually original 14ers or 14thers. And it was because of days. But we do it because it was this revelation of years. And that group of 14ers were the ones there originally prepared for the time of the Lord. In the was, in the is, and there just so happens to be one group in the is to come. It's so fascinating. That's what Polycarp even mentions. Not, not the 14ers, but he mentions this group that had understanding before that he wasn't privy to. Excuse me. And so you, you're going to come to witness all of these things, and that Second 30-minute Bible study is uh, what reveals once you begin to understand these differences in the Gospels, you will then understand that these differences then are telling a different story in different periods of time. And you'll realize that 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is all about the prophetic typology of above pre-trib, then mid-trib, then post-trib, and over a period called 14 years and above. That's the second video uh, or the third video the second 30 minute intro and then the fourth video is the big one it's about two hours and 45 minutes and it's all about it, it's called it's because of matthew and the reason it's called that is because you will finally come to realize that the reason for all of this misunderstanding and this only seven year thinking and seven thousand year thinking and all of it comes because our foundation for hundreds upon hundreds of years has come from the gospel of matthew we didn't really know who Mark and Luke were speaking to, and we just looked at them as added information. But for centuries, through the seminaries, through Bible school, through the churches, it was always from the foundation of Matthew. And we've proven it. And once you realize that it's the foundation of Matthew that has caused you to only see seven years, everything will open up to you and begin to change. Pray over it. Seek it. Ask the Lord to, to send the Spirit to open your eyes so that you can see it, to open your ears, to circumcise your heart, to receive it. And I promise you, it will blow your mind as it has each and every one of us. All right? So now let's get into this 70-year, whoops, let's get into this 70-year portion and why it begins Feast of Trumpets of 1950 for the 70-year count of Israel. Let me show you. We all know that Israel, not Jerusalem, okay? And I think this is one of those really big differentiating factors that we have to remember. God's land is not Israel. His land is Jerusalem. His name is written over Jerusalem, all right? We're not talking about when they came into Israel. We're talking about Jerusalem. And we all know that in 1948, on May 14th, 1948, they were given, a, 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 they became a nation in the land of Israel. But Jerusalem was still contentious. And what happened is in 1948, when they came into the land on, on May 15th and they had a nation, they immediately went to war. And when they went to war, they went to war against uh, five or six nations. And I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Actually, here, let me show you here. And they, they had this armistice agreement in 1949. But the last one to sign was Syria on the 20th of July, 1949. Okay? So these are important things. They, they didn't actually have anything to do with Jerusalem quite yet. These were, they were only declarations that these guys were making. And so let me give you an example. After the establishment of the state of Israel... 
Jerusalem was declared its capital city. Well, by who? Who, who declared it? Well, it wasn't recognized. You see, it wasn't recognized at all. You see, the declaration came on the 5th of December, 1948, by Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion claimed, okay, claimed Jerusalem as part of Israel. And eight days later, the Knesset, Israelis Knesset, we'll talk about them in a moment, moment declared it the capital of Israel. So it was just, they, they just simply declared it. There was no, there was no uh, resolution. There was nothing that, that claimed it was theirs yet. And so, you see, these are the types of things that we can't understand until we get a little bit further and a year passes where things no longer add up. And then another year passes and things no longer add up. Because, see, in this ministry, I am no longer concerned with the timing. I know that the pre-trib is going to happen at the true feast of weeks in the year it's going to begin. That's always been the issue. Have We used to go from event to event, but we don't have to anymore. We've understood it. We know when the pre is, we know when the mid is, and we know when the post is. It has been revealed this year. We've, we've done many videos breaking it down over and over again, and you're going to see these clips that we go into in the Apocrypha. You're going to see even more proof within it of certain ones of these times. And so it's always just a matter of what year. Well, we're well past it being when Israel came into the land. So if the Lord is always talking about his land and it's Jerusalem, maybe we should look more closely at Jerusalem. And so I showed you this armistice, and if they were at war initially right after, and the final agreement wasn't signed until July of 1949, well, then there might be a little bit more going on. It turns out that even though they vocally declared it for themselves on December 8th and December 13th of 1948. Listen to what we read here. The 23rd of January, the Knesset, so the Knesset is their highest government in Israel, okay, has total control over the entirety of the Israeli government. So they're the supreme body, the state in the state of Israel. And it says on January 28th, the Knesset passed a resolution confirming so they passed a resolution confirming, which means in 1948, in December, they were just giving vocal, you know, they were just vocalizing it. But there was nothing actually officially done. And I shared this before that you can go to documents um, in April of 1950 as well, where there were changes made in the UN, um, uh, um, what did they call it? Uh, one of the UN statements. That in the in one of the council meetings that they had, where these changes were being made, so it wasn't until January of 1950 that the Knesset passed a resolution confirming Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Well, that's a big deal. You see, that happened in 1950. If it was already done in December of 1948, then why would they have to have done this in January of 1950? You see doesn't compute one is just making the proclamation the other one is making it so all right and this makes a difference now this is january of 1950 and this is going to be important and for anybody that's been around for a while you know where i'm going to go with this as i briefly get into it so they came into the land in 1948 in may in towards the end of 1948 okay Actually, May would have been over here. This would be Feast of Trumpets, right? So there's Feast of Trumpets, 1948. So in the latter portion of 1948, in December, they make that proclamation. But they're still at war until and in, in agreements to stop the war and all these things with uh, Syria being the last one that signed in July of 49. And it wasn't until... Feast of Trumpets 1949 to Feast of Trumpets 1950 or, or Elul 29, 1950, which means in January of 1950 is when the Knesset finally wrote it out and there was agreement and it was done in January through to April with the UN of 1950. So some people might say, well, why don't we go from January, April of 1950, which means we only have the January of this coming year or maybe April. Well, you have to understand something, okay? 
You have to understand this right here, something I've shared on many times. There is something that's called the mystery of numbers within scripture. And it was discovered uh, in the 90s and, and I think maybe in the 80s or something like that as well. It's acknowledged here. There were two writers that discovered this. And what it's called is it's called accession and non-accession. So let me explain for those that are new. Under the accession year method, if a king died in the middle of the year, okay? So in the middle of a, of a year, whoever was king died, okay? Or prime minister and so forth. Whoever was king, whoever came into, who was in power died. The period to the end of that year is called the accession year of the new king, whose year one would begin at the new year. So if a king, for example, or the leader of Israel was, say, made king on July 23rd, just like we read of 1950, okay, when they when they now officially have Jerusalem claimed as their portion of their capital for the portion that they have, would it start here? No, because this isn't how it works with the kings. So in a session, it means from this point here in 1950, for example, when they got Jerusalem as their portion, it would go all the way to the Feast of Trumpets would be the beginning of year one, which means all of this stuff back to January was called a session. It wasn't counting towards his first year, which means the first year would begin at the Feast of Trumpets and all the rest was just a session. It was, it was the setting up of, of, the, uh, uh, of the first year of the king. But the year won't begin for him until Tishri won. That's how it worked, okay? But there was another way. Under the non-accession year method, the period to the end of the year. So if we use the same example, halfway through the year, the king dies and a new king takes over, the period to the end of that year is called year one. So what does that mean? That means from here, counting from the Jerusalem portion, and you go all the way through again, go all the way through. All this in the non-accession is called year one. And when he gets to the new year, it would be the start of year two, which means his first year in office for the king would have only been six months, give or take. Okay, that's the difference between accession and non-accession. And so whatever number of months, whether it was a month or whether it was 11 months, it makes no difference. In the non-accession, one month would be considered his whole first year. And when the new year begins in non-accession, he starts year two. And whether it was one month or 11 months in a session, all of that prior to Tishri 1 is just the setup, and Tishri 1 begins his first year. When they discovered this, they realized all of these differences in the counts. They would count a king, and, and the year's count would were supposed to be 20, and it would only it would either equal 19 on one side or 21 on the other. And it was this ability to understand the accession of the kings. And this is what the difference was. But what was the difference between the two? Israel or the house of Israel used non-accession. So what that means is if it was the house of Israel in the land in 1950, they would have said from January 23rd until Nisan or Adar 29 to Nisan 1, this would have all been just two months. Okay, just these two months would have been called his first year. And then from Nisan 1, which is where the house of Israel counts from, Nisan 1 would have been the beginning of his second year. But for those that don't understand or are still wondering why, why don't we count it like that is because Judah used the non uh, used the accession method which means the house of Judah, they didn't count to Nisan. The house of Israel counted to Nisan 1 as the start of the year, okay, to Nisan 1. But the house of Judah doesn't count until Tishri 1, okay? Now, why does that matter for new people? The house of Israel 
aren't the ones in the land. Hello. It's the house of Judah. The house of Israel is scattered all over the world. So it's the house of Judah that is in the land of Israel. So we're not counting using the house of Israel to Nisan. We're using the house of Judah, which means from 1950, January 23rd, when they finally had their portion of Jerusalem and claimed it as theirs, this would be as if whoever was king is now assessing, uh, is now coming into the throne in the midst of the year. Okay, was he already was he already uh, um, prime minister David Ben Gurion? Yes, in 1949, January February it was official, but they didn't have Jerusalem. So we're looking at this in the context of them finally getting their portion of Jerusalem. When they get the portion of Jerusalem, it's the house of Judah, which means the house of Judah says all of this is just the accession. And the count will begin now at Tishri 1. So at Tishri 1 of 1950. So we come to Tishri 1, right? Feast of Trumpets is always here. And the last day of the year, Elul 29, is here. And the next day is Feast of Trumpets, 1951, to Elul 29, 1952. All right? So that means for the house of Judah, from when they got Jerusalem, the land that is the father's, it's not a concern with Israel because we're talking about Judah now. You see, when Christ fulfilled these things the first time he came, it was all about the house of Israel. Hello. Now it's going to be about Judah. And who's in the land? Judah. So we are counting in Judah's count form. And so from Feast of Trumpets to 1950 to Feast of Trumpets, or the end of the year, 1951, is the first year, okay? As Judah is the accession count. There's year two, there's year three, there's year four. But it's still not the first year of Israel, right? It's not the first year of them in their count. And the reason for that, as many of you guys know, is the count in Leviticus. It says, and when you shall come into the land, you see, this would have been much easier if it just flat out said Jerusalem. But we see it in so many other places related to the end of days. We know it's about Jerusalem. So when you shall come into the land and shall have planted all manner of trees for food, then you shall count the fruit thereof uncircumcised three years. So for three years, right? Tishri of 1951, right? Feast of Trumpets, one year. Trumpets, two years. To Feast of Trumpets, three years complete. Okay, there's your Leviticus, first three years uncircumcised, you can't take from the land. But in the fourth year, all the fruit thereof shall be holy to praise the Lord with all. So you go to the fourth year. 1953, Feast of Trumpets, to 1954, Elul 29. That's the fourth year where all of this was now to the Lord. Okay, the whole and praise to the Lord. So now what happens? Well, look at what it says next. And in the fifth year, shall you eat the fruit thereof? Meaning from the fifth year forward, all of these trees that were planted when you came into the land that you couldn't take from for three years, the fourth year you brought it to me, in the fifth year, it's now yours to eat. Which means from the fifth year forward, it's yours. So from the Feast of Trumpets, 1954, to the Feast of Trumpets, or Lul 29, 1955, is the fifth year forward that it's now theirs to eat from. So this would be the first year. Well, guess what? In the Sabbath year count, it just so happens it was a brand new Shemitah year cycle. Do you think that's by chance? That it just so happened to work out on a perfect Shemitah year cycle? The new cycle beginning? So you count 70 years, and why do we count 70 years? For a number of reasons, and then once you come to understand Zechariah and 14 chapters have a reason, you will see that Zechariah tells us in verse 12, how long will you not have mercy? There you go, see, on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah. So here's one of those confirmations that he's talking about Jerusalem against which you have had indignation these 
70 years. You see? These 70 years. So what do we see? Where's the 70th year? Right here. These 70 years. So something begins to happen in these 70 years. So it means in the final 70th year, something is going to happen before it comes to an end. And that's the portion that we often talk about from 2 Corinthians chapter 12 in the portion called above. So before this 70 years ends, at the true Feast of Weeks, which would be in 2024, would be, I believe, the pre-trib escape, leaving 50 days to Elul 29 and true um, uh, Pentecost, which is 50 days after true Feast of Weeks. And then it's the Feast of Trumpets at 2024, Feast of Trumpets, to Elul 29, 2025. So there's your beginning of your 14 years of tribulation. That's the 70 years to when they first got a portion of it. But there's still another 70, right? And what we know about this is that in 1967, they got the rest of Jerusalem. You see, in 1967, in June, they captured the rest of Jerusalem. And they gave, this is why they've been moving in since 1967 on the eastern side and building and so forth. And why the Palestinians say they want them all to go back pre-67. But what most of the world doesn't seem to get within governments is that it's it's the um, uh, um, it's the other nations, right? Those the Hamas guys, they don't want them there at all. So they're not looking for any peace agreement. They want them removed from the land. Palestinians, right through their leadership, are saying go back to pre-1967. Why do they say pre-1967? Because prior to that, they only had the one side of, of Jerusalem. That's what's going on. And so it was 1967, but remember, they're the house of Judah. So the official count doesn't begin until Feast of Trumpets of 1967. So Feast of Trumpets, 1967 to 1968. And look at that. It was a Sabbath year when they had their first year, when they captured and the first year kicked off. From 1967 to 1968, Feast of Trumpets, a Feast of Trumpets. Well, fast forward, or in fact, look at and how many years are now in between. From the start of one to the end of the other is what? 14 years. Do you think that's by chance? So what happens when we take this forward and we now understand that there's a 70 here, according to uh, Zechariah chapter 1, and we see a 70 coming to an end. And we can also then go to Jeremiah. And we saw that in Jeremiah chapter 25, this has to do with another typology of a 70 years ending. And how do we know it's another typology of when 70 years are accomplished? And it's because of what we read happens. He's going to bring the sword. He's going to make them all drink of the wine. He's going to bring the sword on all nations. It's going to start at Jerusalem. You see? He's going to bring evil upon his own city. And on all the inhabitants of the earth, he's going to bring the sword as the treading of the grapes, which is the Revelation 19 treading of the grapes. This is the end at the 14th year. When 70 years are accomplished, this is what happens. And, oh, look at this. The slain of the Lord shall be that shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other they're not going to be gathered or nothing you see this is not the beginning of tribulation this is at the end when the lord destroys all the enemies and they'll be dead from one end of the earth to the other and he said that that will come at the end of 70 years when they're accomplished so what do we understand by this? Well, we also know when they captured the, captured the rest of Jerusalem in 1967. We come to 2036 Feast of Trumpets to 2037. And it's the end of 70 years at Elul 29 of 2037. 13 years will have passed from the beginning of tribulation. And that leaves one final year from Feast of Trumpets 2037 to 38 as the final 14th year, 
which is the day of the Lord, and which which is called the day of the Lord and the year of his wrath in Isaiah 34, 61, in Luke chapter 4, Zechariah 14. In fact, look at it here in Zechariah chapter 14. In Zechariah chapter 14, remember what does he do in, in chapter 25? He's not only bringing destruction against um, uh, against the other nations, but he's bringing destruction also against Jerusalem. You see, he's going to bring even destruction against Jerusalem. It says he's going to start in Jerusalem and he's going to what you think that you guys are going to be unpunished when I began it at Jerusalem. Well, go to Zechariah 14 and look at what it says. The day of the Lord. This is the day of the Lord, which is the year of his wrath. And so what do we see? It says, and I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city shall be taken. You see, because he's bringing it against Jerusalem first and the houses shall be rifled and the women ravished and half of the city shall go into captivity and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go, go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. We explained what that means before. And his feet shall stand in that day on the Mount of Olives. So this is when he comes and returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. But what does he do? It's the day of the Lord, which is the year of his wrath. He brings destruction against Jerusalem, and then he brings the battle to all the enemies of the earth. You see? So what are we seeing here? We're seeing a 70 that comes to an end at Elul 29 of 2024, for which there are 50 days in the above before the 14 years that remain begin. And yet when the 13th year is over, we know that there's one more year, which is the days of Noah, and it's the year of the Lord's wrath, which is the prophetic picture of the day of the Lord, the year of his wrath, which would be as it was in the days of Noah, which is why it's in Matthew's discourse only. So you understand why we're excited? Why we're, we're at the edge, if you will? You see, what, what do we do? If this isn't the count and we go past Feast of Trumpets into next year, I don't know. I don't know how much longer we would have. This is the only time where you actually understand the 14, the 13 to 14 years between the two. Giving us a direct prophetic picture of the end of days to the end of 13 and the 14th year, the wrath of the Lord when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. So hopefully... That helps some of you guys. You can understand it. You can see it. You can understand that it really was in 1950. However, we also have to understand that there's a difference between accession and non-accession and that it is the house of Jerusalem that is in the land right now. All right? So hopefully that helps. So now let's get into the gospel or the book of Thomas. So the book of Thomas, we're just going to hit on a couple short points here. In the, in the book of Thomas, it's a bunch of questions presented to the Lord. And there's many we can go into, but these are our two key pieces here right near the, right uh, um, to get us going in it. So in the 16th one, Jesus said, men think perhaps that it is peace which I have come to cast upon the world. They do not know that it is dissension which I have come to cast on the earth. Fire, sword, and war. Pretty crazy, right? Everybody thought Jesus was coming to bring peace. Okay? This was, this was not only in, in the is, so there's the was. So anybody that's new, there's was, is, and is to come. Was is from the beginning of creation until Christ shows up. The is is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib escape. And the is to come is from the moment of the pre-trib escape to the end okay this is even though in the is <clears throat> you could say this is what he was doing but not really right was he bringing division by by families separating because of of christ being in the household and some believing and some not yeah sure but actual fire and sword and war 
that's been going on throughout human history, and, and this is a big part of it, right? It, it's always wars of religion all over the place. However, this is extremely prophetic, okay? For there will be five in a house. Three will be against two and two against three. The father against the son, the son against the father, and they will stand uh, solitary, okay? Now, why is this a big deal? Well, we know exactly what this connects to in the Gospels, especially within Luke and going into Mark's discourse, which is the beginning of the 14 years or the beginning of seals. And in Luke's discourse, this is something we're going to see come up throughout this, this today's teaching. We've talked about it so many times, right? There are There's three watches mentioned here, but I did a video called Four Watches because there's also the apostles who are another group during seals, but they're not mentioned as a watch. I only mentioned them as a watch because I didn't want to say uh, the apostles plus three watches or three plus one watch or something like that. So I just made it as four watches. So this isn't relating to any of the apostles. This is the first group of workers. Okay, let your loins be girded about and you yourselves or your lights burning like unto men that wait for their Lord when he returns for the wedding, that when he opens the door, okay, when he returns from the wedding, what wedding? The Gentile wedding of the pre-trip. So when he comes from that seven-day wedding, that they would open unto him immediately. These are those servants that we've been talking about. This is a group of people prepared even before he shows up the first time. Did you know that this is a group in the beginning of creation? Did you know that this is a group before Christ came the first time for the is? And that there's a group for the is to come? You see, he's taken them. He's about, I should say, to take the pre-trib bride to the wedding. So who are these servants who are already prepared? In the prophetic, they were a group that was already being prepared. They were watchmen. Do you know the word Essenes means watchmen? Pretty wild stuff, man. They were watching. They were prepared. The where the Qumran scrolls, right? Where all the those uh, um, those uh, apocryphas and everything were found, and all these things written. They were found in Qumran in these caves within these jars by the Essene community. Do you know who you are? A typology of. You're like the modern day Essene community. Not only us. But we are a specific portion within them. I know we are. I know for a fact that we are. So anybody listening who's understanding, who has been understanding, who's watching, who's grasping, <laughs> it's awesome. All right? So he's telling them ahead of time. So this is a group that had understanding and was prepared before he showed up. There's only one group. The watchman. And then he talks about a second watch and a third watch. So he's talking to the watchmen. He's talking to the apostles, you can say, as well in this typology. <laughs> okay? But those three watches weren't about the apostles. So as Peter being apostle, maybe it was quite fitting that Peter says, um, said unto the Lord, speak thou this parable unto us or even unto all. Because you see, if Peter representing the apostles, these three watches weren't the apostles. So maybe it was fitting that Peter, as an apostle, was saying, oh, are you saying this to us or are you saying this to all these other guys? He was saying it to the other ones. Okay, The apostles have their own portion as well. And now all of this conversation is going on with these disciples and these servants. Okay, And we know that all of this is only about a day. Okay, that it, it, You would know the day, but this hour, this time that's coming. Okay? There's no day mentioned, but only the hour that wouldn't be known. We've talked about this recently. For the mid-trib group, see, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he's not aware. How fitting is that, right? Go take that even mid-trib or even to post-trib. That's why Mark and Matthew both have day and hour. It's connected to the Feast of Trumpets, which is when the Lord is coming at the end of the six-year seals and at the end of the seventh year of trumpets or at the end of the 13th year of tribulation. But this entire conversation here 
is still to those disciples. He's warning these different groups, the first one of which he's not really giving them warning because they're going to be ready for him. He's warning them in advance, and they're going to be ready when he comes knocking. It's the second and the third group that there's more of a warning for. And then, of course, the apostle that says, hey, is this for us or is this for those guys? Now, he's still having this conversation with these disciples. And in Luke 12, 49, listen to what it says. I am come to send fire. What was the first thing he said? Fire. I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will I if it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptism uh, to be baptized with and how I am straightened till it be accomplished. You see Jesus send fire on the earth when he came the first time? No. Was it a, you see, was it a typology? He was saying fire because he's going to bring the Holy Ghost. Okay, sure, there was that typology. But what's the literal? It's prophetic for when he's sending fire at the end of days. Suppose you, I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. From henceforth, there shall be five in one house divided. Three against two, two against three. The father against the son, against the mother, the daughter, and so forth. You see? What, what is he talking about? This is all the beginning. He starts with fire. Then he brings the sword, right? Remember? We know this from Ezekiel chapter 21, where, where Ezekiel is the prophetic picture of the Son of Man who's coming for 40 days. And when he comes for 40 days and leaves, he's warning for 40 days. And in the warning, he's saying the sword is coming. The sword is furbished. It's about to be released. And when he goes back after the son of man, the white horse rider, what happens three days later? Bam. Holy Ghost, peace is, peace is removed from the earth. And the sword, which is the red horse rider, is now released. When the sword is released, what starts? War. Starts with the destruction of Jerusalem. And then World War III will break out because of the destruction of Jerusalem. This is the beginning of the 14 years, not the fire that comes first. So what is this fire then that would come first? Well, for that, all we have to do is go to Luke chapter 21. In Luke chapter 21, remember he said he's coming to bring fire first, okay? He's coming for fire to, uh, to bring fire first and bring division. Well, look what happens when we come to Luke's discourse, where Luke's discourse is he's warning about Jerusalem being compassed and surrounded. This is because that's what he's doing during the 40 days of the Son of Man. And then what does it say? This is in the portion of the coming of man for the either the pre-trib or the 40 days, which would be after the wedding. It's one of those two. It's only a difference of about eight days. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth. Listen to this. <clears throat> distress of nations with perplexity the seas and the waves roaring men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth it's not just the word on to arrive like impending attack they're going to influence the earth well what do you think this is going to be this is the fire that he's sending this is what we call the stone's throw, the, the meteor that's coming first. That I don't know how big it'll break up, but it's going to hit and devastate much of the earth. Where do I think this is going to happen? I believe it will happen in that first seven to eight days while the wedding is taking place uh, in heaven for seven days, which is what he's warning about in Luke 21, uh, in Luke 12. Okay, He's warning that uh, uh, he's sending, he's telling you that he's sending fire first. Here's the fire being sent down. He's saying that he's going to bring division. And what do we read? Right here in the beginning portion, this is connected to the 40 days of the Son of Man. But before all these, which means before nation against nation, which is the red horse rider. <clears throat> so what does he say? They're going to deliver you up in the synagogues. And it says, um, and you shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren and kinfolk. So this betrayal is already starting in the midst of those 40 days when he returns from the wedding. And then when you go to Mark's discourse, 
which is now the beginning of the 14 years starting. So the above, after Luke's discourse is done, you come to Mark's, uh, Luke's is now done, you come to Mark's, and it starts with the red horse rider, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And what does it say when they're being delivered up? Now the brother shall betray the brother into death, the father, the son, the children against parents. Do you know when you go to Matthew's discourse, you don't read that? That's because that portion will be done because at the end of seals, the John the Baptist type who will be here in the end of days, which relates to that first worker group, are the typology of those that will reunite father and son, mother and daughter, and so forth. Okay? So you can see what's going on. It's, it, it, it's all of these things relating to the beginning of the end of days when he's coming for the 40 days. Now listen to what it says. <clears throat> uh, in the book of Thomas, the 17th question, Jesus answered, I shall give you what no eye has seen and what no ear has heard and what no hand has touched and what has never occurred to the human mind. I believe this also relates to Luke chapter 24 when he opens their understanding of these things and the powers and the abilities that they will have will be greater than the original acts. We've talked on that many times. But now listen to this, one of my favorites. The 18th verse. The disciples, okay, this first worker group, the ones that, that were waiting when he returned from the wedding, said to Jesus, tell us how our end will be. Jesus said, have you considered the beginning that you look for the end. For where the beginning is, there will the end be. Blessed is he who will take his place in the beginning. He will know the end and will not experience death. Well, that's pretty awesome, isn't it? Who do we know who doesn't experience death? The pre-trib group, right? Like Luke chapter 9, verse 27 into 28. Right, The pre-trib group that won't experience death. Who's a group that you know of that has discovered the beginning to find the end who has revealed that in the beginning is where the end is? As far as I know, we might be the only ones. I hope there's more, but I believe we're the only ones. <clears throat> because what is the beginning, brothers and sisters? It's the Aleph. It's the head of the ox. You see, it's the Aleph. Jesus is called the beginning, which is Taurus, and he's called the end, which is the cross. He is the beginning, and he is the end. He is the Aleph and the Tav, the ox and the cross. So what does that mean for us? Why is it important for us? Well, if we go to 2024, I like how that worked. When we go to 2024, when does, the, when does the ox start? Well, the ox is Taurus. Taurus begins in Savan. Taurus is the month of Savan. And so if we were told that we had to go to the beginning to find the end, and we go to the beginning, what do we find? In the beginning, God created. For those who are new, let me show you what that means. In the beginning, God created. And a lot of people haven't caught this. This word beginning is Jesus Christ. This, this word beginning is Christ. This is God the Father. This is why it says, in the beginning, or in Christ, God created. It means Jesus, who was given the authority by the Father, was given to create everything. That's why we read about it in Romans. All things that were in Christ or in somewhere else too. All things that were ever created in heaven and earth and everywhere. Everything was created by Christ. It was given to him by the Father to go and create. How do we know this? Well, there's Christ. There's the Father. There's the Spirit of God. In the first two verses, you have the Son, the Father, and the Spirit. Trying to tell me there aren't three? Of course there are. How do we know the beginning? Well, the beginning is the Hebrew word 7225. And what is it? The first, a first fruit, right? The beginning, the chiefest. What is this word for first fruits? Let me show you for those that don't know. Do you know that the feast of first fruits, right? Remember the feast of first fruits without leaven, right? The one that has no leaven 
is this one right here. Then shall thou bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And when they bake bread with it, it can only be what? Without leaven. A lamb without blemish. There is no leaven in the feast of first fruits, bread, and look at what it is. 7225. Do you know that there's another first fruits at the feast of weeks? But the first fruits at the feast of weeks is the one with leaven, which means it's us, right? The pre trib people and the, the remnant workers, because we have sin. And look at what this first fruits is it's a different one. Because it can't be the same. Jesus is the only lamb without blemish, Jesus is the only one without leaven. So if he is the first fruits, of the first fruits, and you go to Genesis 1, and the word beginning is called first fruits, and Jesus is called the beginning and the end. He's called the Aleph and the Tav, the Alpha, the Omega. What is the beginning? What is the Aleph? It's Taurus. It's the head of the ox, which means in the beginning, which is like Christ, at the beginning was what? Well, if it's like Feast of First Fruits, in creation here, at the very beginning, in the beginning, remember, we're trying to understand the beginning, for in the beginning is where the end is, and the end is where the beginning is. So what do we know about this beginning? It was the 16th day of the first month. It was the 16th day of the first month. But was it back here where we have Nissan? Right, where this Nissan is? No, because the sun has gone off course. So where is it? Where was it? Right here. It was in Taurus. Taurus is Savan. And the 16th day, Savan used to be the first month. So the 16th day of the first month is what? In the beginning. And do you know when Christ came, he was born in the third month, which was the month of Savan, and he was born the 15th into the 16th. Pretty crazy, right? Do you think that was by chance? He was born in the third month, 15th day or so, third month. What would be the beginning? 16th day in Taurus at the end, because at the end is where the beginning is. And why does this, why did the Lord make it like this? And I've, as I've gone through this over the last couple of years, this, it's not to say that we're to count every month as being two months off because the sun really is over here now to start the year. So what is the Lord telling us? He's showing us a count that is for the next first fruits. He was already the first of the first fruits. It was already fulfilled. He's now talking about corn, which is called wheat. And this is the time frame of the beginning of the wheat harvest. It goes late June to early mid-ish. Uh, uh, it goes late May, sorry, into early mid-ish June of any given year. And in 2024, there's a second Adar. So it goes out one month, a little bit longer than usual. Okay, so this is where the count comes from, as if it was Nissan, even though we know it's the third month. This is actually the true count of the Feast of Weeks. So what do you do from here? You count seven Sabbaths, one true Sabbaths, two, three, four, five. It's the eighth, 15th, 29th of every Hebrew month. And then you get uh, six and Seven, you come to the eighth of Av. And do you, we've talked about it many times. I don't want to go down this rabbit hole. But we know that late July to early mid-August of any given year is when the weed harvest has been brought in. And guess what they do? Guess what they do, brothers and sisters? At around that time, every single year, the winter wheat harvest is now complete and brought in. And do you know what they do with it? They bring in two wave loaves with leaven. 
It's been happening for hundreds and hundreds of years. Do you know the only way that that could happen is if it's being counted by the actual wheat that it's supposed to be, and that is winter wheat, not spring wheat? That alone should explode your mind to go and dig into it. And so what happens from the seventh Sabbath? Well, this is the pre-trib escape. If next year is the true year of, of, the, of everything beginning, this is the pre-trib, and this begins the 50 days, or you know, evening to evening. This begins the 50 days. The 50 days will end on the 29th of Elul, which is true new wine. And that's why from mid midish to late September into early October is always the new wine harvest season when new wine is done. Crazy how that works, right? And look what comes next. Tishri 1. Destruction. Now it begins at what? The day and hour no one knows, but not, not the Mark and Matthew one yet. But what is this talking about? This is now the beginning of the 14 years. Who counts from here? Well, lo and behold, that's what we were talking about, wasn't it? We see for the house of Judah begins from Tishri to Tishri or from Tishri to Elul 29. So Tishri of 2024, and what does it begin? The first year of tribulation. Everything in order, brothers and sisters. So what did we have to find? He's telling the disciples in the is a prophetic revelation of the is to come because these disciples did not know what we know. You realize that? He's telling them if they find the beginning, they'll find the end. For in the beginning, there is the end and they will not taste of death. Do you know that every single one of these disciples tasted death? So who was he talking to? Hello. A group who would find the beginning? Because in the beginning would reveal the end? That's that's some wild excitement there, guys. Okay? So when we were in here in the beginning, we know that this revealed what? <clears throat> this was, th this is called the gap theory. Some people say they believe it reveals the billions or hundreds of millions or tens of millions of years that came first. Nope. It reveals the first 7,000 years or seven days to the Lord. And it plays a prophetic picture of the end. What is that prophetic picture? It's the seven Sabbaths and the 50 days. That is the prophetic picture. You see, we needed to count and to understand that from the beginning is the revelation that to understand the end, you must understand the beginning. For in the beginning, there the end is. It's directly connected to what John the Baptist said. John the Baptist, in, uh, uh, sorry, John in chapter one of John, it said, in the beginning was the word. See, the same was in the beginning with God. Wait a second. The beginning was with God. The beginning was with God. The beginning as in, in Christ, God created, which means Christ was with God. In the beginning was with God. In the beginning, the same was the beginning with God. Hello. And then what happened? Then he was made light. So when we go back to here, we now see, then God made the Lord light. So he was spirit and created all things. Then the father made him light. And when the light started, now you've got day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven days to the Lord as 7,000 years if we were in the dimension if if we were in the dimension of time during these days of the Lord to us it would have been 7,000 years but to him there was no time we weren't there yet and so it was only days and what happened well listen to what it says in John chapter 1 Jesus is made light and the light that shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not so this is like a picture of the Son of Man now coming to start the 40 days. It says, there was a man sent by God whose name was John. The same, listen to this, came for a witness, to bear witness of the light. 
he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So what does that mean? That means John the Baptist had to be part of this spirit group, which are those who have the spirit of God. And it just so happened that it was John the Baptist, was it not? It just so happened that it was John the Baptist who at conception had the spirit. The only way that he could have been a witness to the light is if he was part of the spirit group in the beginning. And that's exactly what John was. So if you go all the way back to the beginning of creation, John was part of this spirit realm group created so that he can bear witness to Jesus being made light. Hello. That's the only way he could bear witness. The only way you can bear witness to the light is if you came before the light. See, it doesn't mean that Jesus was in spirit as well. Of course he was. He's the one that created all spirit. He was the beginning of it all. But John was part of that spirit as well before Jesus was made light by the Father. Which means what? <clears throat> Which means in the beginning, there was a group who was prepared, who was the spirit realm, who were witness to Christ becoming light. Which means... In the is, when Christ comes, there was somebody who was part of the beginning, who was here before Christ, who could be witness that he was coming as the light of men. So there was a was, there was an is, and there's an is to come. Now, you have to understand, it's not only John. But remember, John is a typology because at the same time, remember what it said in Luke 19, uh, in Luke 12, when he's talking in the prophetic typology of the end, when he's going to send fire, like we were reading in, in the uh, book of Thomas, we see that what? He's coming to send fire and he's coming to bring division within households, which means there has to be a prophetic John the Baptist type in the end of days. Because during seals, just like we saw in the discourse from Luke's discourse, going into Mark's discourse, we see that there's father against son, mother against daughter, causing them to be put to death, betraying each other, this means, knowing that Mark's is the seven years of seals, this is telling you that during this period of seals, in that first portion of seals, is where all this betrayal is happening. Which means there still has to be a prophetic end of days John type who will restore them back to each other so that at the mid-trib great multitude rapture, they will be renewed. That's why you find it in Mark's story of the transfiguration. But you don't see any mention in Luke's transfiguration. Remember, it goes Luke, Mark, Matthew in the end of days. In Luke's transfiguration, you see nothing about a mention of, I thought, Elijah, and it was John that came first. The first mention of it is in Mark's transfiguration. When you go in the end, Luke, Mark, Matthew. That's the real way it goes in the end. The first will be last, the last will be first. In the Synoptic Gospels. And so in the picture, as we've taught many times, of Mark's transfiguration, it's a picture of the Lord coming after the end of the first six years of seals. That's why you see him at the end of the sixth year of seals and everybody's freaking out. Mountains and rocks fall on us and all this craziness, right? And so when you read that story in the transfiguration, you see that this says, oh, I thought John would come first and he says he did and he restored all people. Funny how that works, isn't it? There you see it happening in the midst of seals. You don't read about it in Matthews because that's trumpets and that time is now past. Because John restores them for the great multitude rapture. All of these things, dude, they're, they're, they're discussed in these things right here. 
in this one little section of the gospel or the book of Thomas. The beginning, the end. In the end is the beginning. The fire, the sword, the war, the division within households. It's all revealed. The beginning has to be there before the light. So the only way to be a witness is if you are part of the beginning, which means you are part of the spirit realm. And how are you a part of the spirit realm? Is if you are spirit-filled in Christ. Those are the ones that go pre-trib and the portion that we were reading about in Luke that remain for when he returns from the wedding. Which means they had to be a group already spirit-filled in Christ to be a witness for when the Lord returns from the wedding when he will come to do what? Shed his light. Because who is he shedding his light for? The house of Israel, who he came for the first time and saved, right? He died for the sins of the world, but he came for what? He came but for the house of the law, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So this is the end. The seals is the end of that portion of the lost sheep for the house of Israel. He's coming to save all the remaining lost sheep of the house of Israel. And when he comes for those 40 days, he's coming to shine his light in the darkness. Exactly as we've taught. Exactly. Look at this. From Isaiah chapter 9, one of the ones I love to go to now. Right? Because there was that light affliction that's coming on the two northern cities of Israel. There's going to be an attack and major destruction in Haifa and Tel Aviv when the 50 days begin at the pre-trib escape. And then what is he going to come and do? That the people walked in darkness have seen a great light. Upon them the light shined. Who is the light? For unto us a child is born. See how crazy that is? And a lot of people would say, well, 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 isn't that really uh, then at the birth of Jesus? Shouldn't we have that timing? And this is one of the reasons I was bringing this up. Shouldn't it actually be not connected to, to down here is the pre-trib escape? If the Lord's coming back after the pre-trib and he's coming on the eighth day, then he's coming back on the 16th of Av to begin his 40 days. Why would it be down here if you just finished telling me that Jesus' birth is right here? Right? That 15th, 16th, as it was in the beginning. Because what we find out is I'm not going to go into, we've done it already before many times. This fulfillment of this that's being spoken about here was fulfilled in Matthew chapter 4. So the was was fulfilled in the is, and the fulfilling of it in the is to come is when the Son of Man comes for 40 days. And what did we find out? He's not coming as the light who the remainders are bearing witness to. He's not coming for that exactly on his birthday. We found out that it was about two months later because John was not yet in prison, and then he was in prison, which was about two months later. And it said in Matthew 4 that when Jesus came in this, fulfilling this in the is, that he came when John was now, he heard that John was now in prison. And guess what? It just so happens from Savan 16 to Av 16 is exactly two months. I love that one. When I, when I was given this one, when the Spirit led me in this one, I flipped out it was something that i just wasn't grasping and i freaked right out so what are we seeing we're seeing as i said as i finish this portion off there's the spirit realm first who had to be witness or who were obviously witness to the light portion that came next this light portion is a prophetic picture in the beginning to show of his coming for 40 days and then will be followed by the 14 years starting and that's why you see then it was what Light in the day were the first day. Creation portion first. The spirit group. John was. And John is a prophetic type of a group for the end of days. Who will be the workers who are called his witnesses. Just like John was. And do you know that that prophetic Luke. Uh, that prophetic group. If you go to the last chapter of Luke, Mark and Matthew. And read what the different um, instructions are. They're all different. We've done videos on this many times over the years. The only group that are called his witnesses is the Luke group. 
this Luke remnant worker group, which means they're the spirit-filled John types. They will go out from Jerusalem, and he calls them his witnesses. Who was the witness in John chapter 1 from the spirit realm and the spirit being turned, coming, uh, uh, being made light? See, and the darkness comprehended it not. It's the same story from Isaiah 9 all the way to the creation to the beginning of the end of days gospel starting in Luke. And they're going to be given the light of the Lord to go and spread the light of the Lord to all of the lost sheep of the house of Israel because that portion is coming to an end. Craziness how exciting it is. And then you can come to John 1, 14, and then you see what? The word was made flesh. So he was spirit in the beginning, right? He created everything in the spirit. Then the father made him light, and it was the portion of the creation of light, which was the days. And then just like Adam, Adam was made flesh. It began the flesh portion in the 7,000 years. And Jesus is called what? The second or the last Adam. And here he was being made flesh as Adam was. <laughs> Oh, it's so good. God is good. I'll tell you guys, this isn't me. It's never been me. I've always said it. I'm just the mouthpiece on the other side. So what does this have to do with the group of us? Well, everybody who is a watchman in Christ, spirit-filled, we're a portion, and, and not only as workers, all of them in Christ who are not chosen to remain to work, they're going pre-trib. But there's a group who was a group of watchmen before Christ came as the light. Which means in the beginning, they were that light portion as John would be that light portion. John was the fulfillment of the is of a group of watchmen, of a group of people preparing for the coming of Christ. And in the beginning, it was the spirit creation before the light. In the is, it was the creation, it was John, sorry, uh, uh, spirit-filled coming before Christ as preparing a way. You see what's happening? And it wasn't only John. John was the specific person. But there was a group of watchmen. Like, do you know in, in the beginning of creation? In the spirit realm, there was what? <clears throat> they were the what? The sons of God that had the spirit of God. Weren't there some that fell from it, right? And they became the bad guys? Well, we know from Romans 8 that the sons of God are those who are spirit filled with the spirit of God. So there are good ones in this representation that are alive on the earth right now representing this group. Just as John was like the main representation of it. But it wasn't only John. You see, these sons of God were called what? All the way back at the beginning of the creation. They were part of the spirit realm, right? Some of them fell, but not all of them. But what were they called? They were called the sons of God. What did the sons of God do? They were watchmen. They were watchmen. So you've got this is at the very, I mean, the was in the very beginning of a group of sons of God who were watchmen. Yes, some of them fell, right? We're going to see there's a punishment for another group later. That's why there were three watches. We know which group in the second one gets punished. But there was a whole bunch that didn't fall. And John the Baptist is just a representation as one person of it. But this other group of first watchmen of disciples is another group of them. And in the is, when John was there before Christ, <laughs> it wasn't only him. It was a group of Essenes. There were a group of watchmen believing that the end of days was coming. They had understood through the study of the sun, moon, and stars. And that's what I'm going to share with you here. And unfortunately, only one mic is working, so it's not going to come through very loud. But you can go in and search this if you want. 
I'm only going to play about three minutes of it, exactly three minutes of it. And just pay close attention. I'll be quiet so you can hear it. And at first, he's just talking about stuff with the Maseroth, and he calls it, you know, uh, uh, um, what's that word that they use for the Maseroth, you know, the constellations, uh, uh, um, the bad word for it, right? He explains that, look, I I'm just repeating to you, these things are in Scripture, so don't get distraught by them. They're in Scripture. But then he goes in to talk about a group of Essenes, okay? The Essenes had this group. They were in this community. They were a part of this group. This is where the Apocrypha, this is where these things, these Qumran scrolls that were found of which there was a community and a teacher of righteousness that that showed up and and began to reveal things to them but guess what if he had been the one for the end of days because when you go and study it that original first teacher of righteousness has a pred i mean has as a future one of him because if he had revealed the things we would already know them but it didn't start getting revealed, brothers and sisters, until six years ago. You see how crazy that is? And it talks about within those papers, that within those documents, that without this person and this community being built, the end of days could not be yet near. The only problem is nobody had a clue. Nobody knows that that has to happen. And even if it was happening like it is here through us, who else even understands it and knows it? You see? So it's one of those things. Does it really matter? No, but it's crazy wild when you can read about it in documents 2,100 years old. <laughs> it's crazy. So let's listen to a few minutes of this. I've got this on full. I'm at like 80-something on here. So let's just listen to what he says. Cosmology was what the Hebrews had with the 12 constellations. Oh, I don't know why I can't hear it. Remember the high priest would go in, would have the 12 gemstones on his... Oh, I know why I can't hear it. I can't hear it because it's only through one microphone and it's not the one... Oh, let me see if it's working in this one. Sorry, give me a second. All right, because I only had my one side of my earbuds in. All right, let's start this over. Here we go. Cosmology was what the Hebrews had with the 12 constellations. Remember the high priest would go in, would have the 12 gemstones on his breastplate, symbolizing the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, go and have a read of what the gemstones were. They are the 12 birthstones, each one of which match up one of the 12 constellations of the Zodiac. Now, we have been, we have had so much fear preached at us about the occult and horoscopes and so on, that we're scared to even mention, but it's in the Bible. I never put it in there. I'm just telling you, it's in there, okay? <laughs> so if you don't like it, don't blame me. Um... You'll find that, in, so I've already mentioned the book of Job uh, talks about it, but you'll find that a lot of, uh, most of the um, apocalyptic books of the Bible, for instance, like Revelation and Ezekiel, they have uh, the constellations in there quite a lot. Another thing that you'll discover is the ancient synagogues, including synagogues from the time of Jesus, synagogues that Jesus probably preached in himself, would have on their floor a mosaic of the 12 constellations of the Zodiac. Now, Jesus was not scared at calling out the false religion of his day. If there had been anything wrong with that, he would have called it out, and he didn't, okay? So what, but they were not casting horoscopes. Uh, what, where, what did this mean? In fact, one of the things about the Dead Sea Scrolls, one of the interesting discoveries of the Dead Sea Scrolls is what um, scholars have called the Messiah's horoscope. It's not really a horoscope, but that's just a word they use because we use the word in, in English today. What, one of the things was the Essenes, who are the only Jewish group that Jesus doesn't criticize in the Gospels, the only group that Jesus doesn't criticize in the Gospels. Why do you think that is, brothers and sisters? Because they were spirit-filled, right? Or in our typology, end of day, spirit-filled, right? In Christ. Were they in Christ? Christ wasn't there yet. <clears throat> but in Christ that they were ready. They were watching. They were praying. They were diligently seeking him. Do you know that this group of people with the Essenes that they separated themselves from the synagogues and all the Pharisees and Sadducees because they thought they were corrupted. Sound familiar? Like separating and, and not wanting to go to the churches anymore because it's all lukewarm and watered down. And yeah, there are some good ones here and there, but you know, for the most part, the majority of us that are watchmen tend to not really be too interested in going to the churches, but there is good, you know, communion and camaraderie and so forth, and and some like-minded brothers and sisters. 
But for the most part, it's just so basic and so diluted. We know when we go with this understanding, nobody wants to hear us, and we don't really want to listen to their confusion for an hour. These guys were the same. Um, they, they admitted that because he came from Nazareth, which was an Essene stronghold. It was a very strong Essene area. It was called Nazareth because the Essenes also called themselves Nazarenes. And, that, and this village's name, and I'll, 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 I need to watch. I got away off on tangents, and I'm not careful. So but the Essenes were one of one, the only Jewish group that knew that they were living in the time of the coming of the Messiah because they had worked it out using the constellations, which maps the charts of the ages, and they had written a scroll saying that the old covenant was about to come to an end because the Messiah was about to come. Isn't that interesting? Okay, so they had understood these things. <coughs> Excuse me. They had understood these things before he showed up. He goes on to talk about that when Pentecost came and they were all in the upper room and the, the, the priests and stuff that were there, they, they were the Essenes. There was a whole group of Essenes because they knew the timing of the Lord. This was a whole group of people. What? Be or he showed up as the light. Before he showed up as the light. Which means they were also a prophetic typology of being this group from the was. They were part of this John type of group in the is. John is just the, the main character, if you will. But you even heard, and you've probably heard it before. Jesus never said anything wrong or bad to the Essenes. The Essenes were called, their name means watchmen. They separated themselves from the churches because they thought they were corrupted and they, they, were, they were all watered down and they were, they were listening and following these things through interpretation instead of the word. <laughs> Sound familiar? <clears throat> and what did he say about these, these, these uh, Essenes? Well, they were called Nazarene, right? The Nazarenes or in plural. And what does it mean? It means that they were, uh, uh, I thought I had it here. They were lookout, right? They were watchmen. The word means watchmen. And I had it here somewhere. It might have been on another portion I was looking at. But the word, oh, I think I did save it. Uh, no, I didn't. So what it means is, uh, oh, sorry, that's right, because it was Essenes. The word Essenes means watchmen. And so these were the Nasserenes, okay, plural. Or Nastrum. Who were these guys? They were the Essenes. They were the, the Nazarenes, right? They were the ones prepared and watching for Christ, understanding it through the constellations and through scriptures. And here we are revealing it through the scriptures in the mysteries that would be revealed to a group ahead of time who are watchmen for the Lord in advance, spirit filled, connected to the beginning, who would bear witness to the light. And there was a group in the is who was fulfilling the original was, which means there has to be a group in the is to come who is in the is prepared, understanding the revelation for the is to come. When he will come is what? When he begins his 40 days as light. Who is that group? It's the Luke 12 group. It's the Luke 12. It's this first group we were just talking about. Let your loins be girded about when he returns from the wedding. It's the ones that is they're the same ones connected to Luke 24, the ones that would be witnesses as John was to the light coming. And he said that they were, <coughs> excuse me, that they were Nazarenes. Well, you guys will remember this, right? Who were the early believers? The early believers had no building, no money, no political influence, and were not Christians, right? They followed the Lord. They followed his commandments. They were called what? Quadradecimen, they were called 14ers. You, you know how much I freaked out when I first saw this, right? When these things were shared with me about two or three years, maybe a couple of years after I had started calling us 14ers, look at what it says. All the, early fall, or all the earlier followers of Messiah called themselves Nastrim. You see? They're the Nastrim, the Nazareans. These are the ones Jesus never said anything against them, and these are the ones that understood the timing of, of his coming, the time frame when he was going to show up. While the Romans, who later called themselves Christians, referred to the early followers of Messiah's quadradecimin or 14ers. Remember what I was saying earlier? 
because they stood on the 14th day of Abib as true Passover, regardless of where it fell. Not like, don't, don't follow what this guy is saying here, okay? Regardless of where it fell. Whereas we were doing it because of the years. And we've shown all throughout scripture that days can be prophetically interpreted into years. We've shown it all throughout scripture. And then we find out that there was a group that were 14ers as days and were the 14ers as years. A group prepared in advance to watch for and understand the timing of the Lord. And they were called 14ers before the word Christian. Why does that matter? When did the word Christian come into play? Not until the time of Constantine, right? Not until this time frame of the 300s when the, when the term in Christian really comes into play. Well, why does that matter for us? Because we know in this portion right here, these guys were called 14ers. Who was the head of Smyrna? Polycarp. Polycarp. We read from the story of Polycarp that Polycarp was a 14er. He <laughs> was one of the original 14ers. But did you know that before Polycarp, there was already a group prepared for when Christ showed up? They were a group who had understanding and who had a teacher in the community who was making known to them these things in advance through the revelation of Scripture. And through the, the, the stars, the constellations. And that there would be one in the end who would make known the mysteries of the prophets that not even the prophets understood to reveal the understanding of the end of days that before they came, it was never yet understood. That's why the churches have been mixed up. You see, when did church, <clears throat> when did Christian really come into play? Not until the prophetic time of Constantine or Pergamum. And what do we show in the seven churches in the revelation of the 14 years of the end of days? This is the time of uh, um, the tribulation of seals, Mark's discourse. And this is when they flee into the wilderness. Because why? Antichrist, the Constantine type, Antichrist is on the stage. And who's he going after? Christians! <laughs> But who were the ones that came first? They were called 14ers. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. You know, I feel like I feel like this guy here, right? I didn't write these things. I, I didn't write any of this. These things were things discovered way after I had been teaching and revealing these things and calling us these things. That all of this revelation that brought us back to whoever finds the beginning finds the end, for in the beginning there the end is. There was a group in the is pre, there was a group in the is pre, and there is a group in the is to come pre. Talk about wild, right? I told you, man, this is... <clears throat> It just gets so awesome. Now, we won't spend a lot of time here in Polycarp because we just shared it in the last one. But in the epistle of Polycarp, as we mentioned in the last one, I'm just going to tie this in because this is the, the point I'm at with it. We know that Polycarp, as I was showing to you in the seven churches, we know that Polycarp comes at this time of Smyrna. He was called a 14er. But... There was a group even before this. Who was the group prepared before this? The Luke 24 group. The Luke 24 group is this group as well. There are, or I should say they're a part of this group. But do you know that the Luke 24 group and those two in the Luke 24 group that we call the, the, the pre-remnant workers, the, the Luke 12 ones that we said when he returns from the wedding, the ones that are the two on the road to Emmaus we were talking about. Do you know <clears throat> that we're told about them? That the things that must be fulfilled in the law of Moses, which is the law, 
in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning him, and then he opens unto them their understanding. This is the group here represented by those who are given the revelation and the understanding. There's only one group right now that I know of on the earth that's being prepared in the revelation of these things, knowing them in advance, not fully. But when the Lord comes to begin his 40 days, he will open it up to them. As he says right here, do you know that he only does this to Luke's group? This is the only group represented by Smyrna for which Polycarp is a part of. But do you know that Polycarp doesn't have part in that revelation? But they're all part of it together in, in the worker group. Listen to what he says here. For if we please him in this present world, we will receive from him that which is to come even as he promised us to raise us from the dead. And if we are worthy citizens of his community, pretty wild, right? Because there was actually a community before. We will also reign with him. So Polycarp, who is the, is the bishop of Smyrna, who is a 14er, who is working and will be working with this group, He's telling them that we will be together to reign with Christ in the resurrection. The only ones who we know from Revelation who will rule and reign and reign with Christ are those from Smyrna who will not be hurt by the second death. The only ones, as you know, who don't get hurt by the second death are these guys right here who put their necks on the line and so forth, they'll be resurrected and, and will reign with Christ a thousand years. That is the first resurrection. You see, the rest of the dead won't be resurrected yet. Only this group has part in the first resurrection and those who were promised it from ancient days, right? Their, their promised peace on earth, their, their time of millennial reign. But the only other ones that will be resurrected with them is this Smyrna group for which Polycarp is talking to this group as they are together in it that will take part in the first resurrection on which what? The second death has no power. You see? It's only that group. So Polycarp is clearly talking to another group here, but he's with them in this time of Smyrna as he's also a 14er. So let's go into that other piece of him when he says this very important part in the same in the epistle of Polycarp. For I am confident that you are well versed in the writings and from you nothing is hidden. But to me, this is not granted. Which means Polycarp, even though he's a part of this group, he is not, he is not one of the Luke 24 portion who has the understanding given to them. And do you know there's only one group that we know of where this has been happening? And that 2,100 years ago, there was a writing by a group from the was going into the is that revealed there was from the is going into the is to come that would be the one to reveal it? That when the Lord comes, what is he going to do? He's going to make known to them the rest of the understanding. This is when he's returned from the wedding. When he came and he, and he served them. He came and he served them and had bread and sat and ate with them. And then he opens unto them the rest of the understanding. Craziness, guys. Absolute craziness. What else do we know? Let's finish up another piece with Polycarp. Right? Polycarp, at his death, he was 86 years old. <clears throat> this was a big deal as well. Because we know in Genesis 16, we have a prophetic typology of the end of days in the story of Abraham and his two sons. Right? We know that he has Ishmael first, and Ishmael is the prophetic picture of the lion, right? The Arab, 
the the one who when when Tishri one comes, Jerusalem will be attacked and destroyed. If next year is the first year when it all begins, at the end of fifty days, they receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost. They go out and Jerusalem is destroyed first by the modern day Israel Ishmael, who is the king of the north. And we know it's thirteen years, and Abraham is ninety nine. Ishmael is 13, and then bang, the 14th year, Abraham's 100, and the promise of, of Isaac, who is the picture of Messiah, comes at the 14th year. Why does it matter to the story of, of Polycarp saying he was 86? Because Abraham was 86 years old when he had Ishmael, and it's the prophetic picture of the beginning of what? 86 years old is the prophetic picture of 13 years and then the 14th, the promise comes. So what is what is Polycarp also a prophetic picture of? The end of the 50 days where what? The dove comes and then at the same day, next day, right evening of that, of that day, what happens next? It's the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows. And Polycarp is 86 years old. This is why I was saying it in the in the last video. Why, why was this such a big deal that he was also 86 years old? Okay? Because in the next portion, we see that he was 86, that he says, I bless you that you have granted me this day and hour that I may share among the number of the martyrs. So he's 86 years old. He's now being put to death at a day that he's calling day and hour. You see how fascinating that is in the prophetic end time picture? <clears throat> What's he saying? This is the end of 50 days. He's 86 years old. And he's saying it's the time of day and hour, which is like the day and hour no one knows. And then you're also going to see that when he's killed, what do we see happen? After the, he mentions day and hour and it says, at length, the lawless men, seeing that his body could not be consumed by the fire, commanded an executioner to go up and pierce him with a dagger. And when he did this, there came out a dove. What happens on this day? He's 86 years old, day and hour, and it's true Pentecost when the dove goes out. All of it, a prophetic picture to the timing at the martyrdom of Polycarp. And why is he saying to be as the others? We know that the others played out over what, a hundred years and change. But we also know, and we've taught on this many times, that in the end of days, these things that played out over like 2,500 years and 2,000 years, in the end of days will play out in 50 days and 14 years. That's how incredibly tense the end of days is going to be incredibly tense so what do we know about him being the bishop of smyrna well he's going right to the beginning of the 14 years and what do we know from luke chapter 21 <clears throat> right let me find it luke 21 i'm sure i had oh here's one what do we know in luke chapter 21 well remember what it said when they're going to get persecuted right away? See, before nation against nation, some of you are going to be cast into prison. Some of you are going to be put to death. When he says that, he's talking about in the prophetic, this group that is already being, ta being taken captive, being put into prisons and put to death, some of them. He is this prophetic picture in 2024 of being the one having it happen right at the time when the 14 years are going to happen. At the time of Pentecost, soon as it ends. There were others that died along the way. Right here. Because when the pre-trib happen begins, everything on earth is going to change. Remember, he's bringing fire first. There's the there's the attack in northern Israel to uh, Haifa and Tel Aviv will be destroyed. That he calls the light affliction before he shows up and sheds his light. And he sheds his light on the disciples so that they'll be able to go and reach those who are the lost sheep of the house of Israel, which is the group during seals for the great multitude rapture. 
It's so awesome. Crazy, crazy, amazing, guys. Now let's go into second Esdras. Second Esdras, we've mentioned this one many times over the years. So I don't want to spend too much time, but I do want to be detailed. This is um, going into my favorite part of it. He goes into many other details, but this, where we are here, is in chapter 13, starting in verse 29, and this is the book of 2nd Esdras. And listen how he starts. Behold, the days are coming when the Most High will deliver those who are on the earth. This right here is your pre-trib escape. We call it escape. It's like a rapture, okay? This is the pre-trib escape right here. And we can prove it by what comes next. And bewilderment of mind shall come on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. So let's go to Luke 21 in this. <clears throat> in Luke 21, we know where the pre-trib is, right? It's verse 36. But you can start reading from verse 34. And this is where you get the understanding from 2nd Esdras. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with the suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day, okay, this day that you can be aware of, don't be caught off guard by being caught up in these things, so that that day come upon you unawares, okay? So you can know of this day if you're watching and you're praying and you're not caught up in the things of this world and caught up in drunkenness, okay? Now listen what it says in verse 35 of Luke 21. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. This is your pre-trib bride of Christ. And this is the rest of the world who is caught off guard in the snare, totally having missed what's come. There is your pre-trib bride of Christ gone, Luke 21, 36. And this is verse 35 telling them that all those who dwell on the face of the earth are now caught are now caught off guard. They're bewildered. They're they're bewildered. They're they're in shock. They don't know what's happening. And then what do you see in verse 31? Second Esdras, and they shall plan to make war against one another, city against city, place against place, people against people, kingdom against pe kingdom. Hello. Red horse rider. Red horse rider right here. You see? There's this period while they're planning it, while they're planning it, what's happening? It's the 40 days of the Son of Man, the white horse rider who was here first, <clears throat> who was coming to shed his light to warn them, right? And, and that group following him that would receive his light so that they can go and spread it throughout the time of seals to bring in the great multitude rapture. When he comes to bring division, these guys, as the John types, spirit-filled, will be the ones having received the light and we'll go and reunite them during the time of seals. But really, the greatest revival in human history will happen during tribulation of seals. And by the end, they will be reunited through this group working. So here's now, they will plan to make war against each other. Now there's the war breaking out. And listen what it says. Now it does a fast forward. And when these things come to pass... And the signs occur, which I showed you before. So he's saying about all the other stuff I was telling you earlier. <clears throat> and when those things, okay, and I'd shown you before, then my son will be revealed. So when is his son being revealed? And when all nations hear his voice, every man shall leave his own land and the warfare they had, they have against one another and an innumerable multitude shall be gathered together as you saw, desiring to come and conquer him. This is the end of the first six years of seals. This is the end of the sixth seal when they see the Lord coming <coughs> and everybody's freaking out. The rocks and mountains fall on us, right? This is six years later. So if it started at Feast of Trumpets with a war against each other when they finally started at Feast of Trumpets, 50 days after this, or 51 days after this, after the pre-trib, what would be six years later when they see him coming? It's the end of the sixth year of seals. 
And what do we see at the sixth year of seals? We go to Mark's discourse. And we look about when Jesus is coming. And what do we see at Jesus is coming? And in those days after that tribulation, look at this. And the stars of heaven shall fall. <clears throat> That's the sixth seal. Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in, which means in the clouds, plural. And what does it say about it? It's going to be a day and hour no one knows. Hello. Day and hour no one knows. Which means if it started on the day and hour, six years later, from the red horse rider starting to the end of the first six years of seals, from the red horse to the end of the sixth seal is six years. And what's going to happen? They're going to see an innumerable multitude coming together to come to conquer him. But where is he going to show up? On Mount Z Wait, is he going to show up on Mount of o Olives? No. He's going to stand on the top of Mount Zion. What? The only way that could be true is if he's coming for another group mid-trib before he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. So what's this war when they want to come conquer him? This is the Ezekiel 39 war. This is why <clears throat> when you go to Zechariah 14, like we showed earlier, we see that the day of the Lord. So this is the beginning. This is the 14th year in Zechariah chapter 14. And what does he say? In verse 3, he says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. This is all past tense. What was this other day that he fought in the day of battle? It was the Ezekiel 39 war. The Ezekiel 39 war is the end of the six years of seals. It's this war right here. They're going to see him coming, <coughs> and people are going to be freaking out, hiding in the mountains. This is when he comes on Mount Zion. This is the 100% reason why in Revelation 14, you see the lamb standing on Mount Zion with the 144,000. Because after that war, the Ezekiel 39 war, at the end of the sixth year of seals, the first group he seals are who? The 144,000 on Mount Zion. Hello. And when he comes on Mount Zion, what does it say in verse 36? And Zion will come to be made manifest to all people. See, that's why they're all freaking out at the end of the sixth seal. They're seeing this coming. And all of those that are going to come against him in the Ezekiel 39 war are coming to try to fight and defeat him. And what is it called? It's called the place prepared and built. It just so happens, just like Revelation 14, if you go into John 14, which has 21 chapters, like the seven easy years, seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets, chapter 14 is a picture of the seventh year of seals. And what did he say he would do? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. You see the prophetic picture? Exactly in what we call the chapters to years that it would play out that would equal the seventh year of seals. You see, if you go to our chapters to years, see there's the seven easy years that he worked for Leah. Seven years for Rachel, six for the cattle, takes you to the end right here. And then there's the 21st being the 14th. So this was all the preparation in the spirit, getting the bride ready, right? Getting the people spirit filled, waking them up. And then it's seven of seals, seven of trumpets. So where are we? Chapter 14 of John. And look at where we get the seventh year of seals. <clears throat> and what did it tell us? The place prepared. And what did it say? In 2nd Ezra's, exactly where it should when he's on Mount Zion, he's coming on the mountain carved without hands. Exactly as you read, as we've shared many times, this is when he comes in Daniel chapter 2. So let me help you guys see that, that are newer. 
in Daniel chapter 2, you have the whole image of, right, with Nebuchadnezzar <clears throat> and the dream. And you see the head of gold and the body and the arms and the legs and the toes, right? And it says what? In verse, uh, in Daniel 2, verse 34, thou sawest till that a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon his feet uh, that were of iron and clay and break them into pieces. And the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broke to pieces together and break and, and became the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image, here it is, became a great mountain. This is when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion, and the ten toes are a picture prophetically of the ten horns of the beast. This is why, again, we've shared this recently. When you go to Revelation chapter 17, you see this is when the king of kings and lord of lords in lowercase goes to make war, and who does he fight? He fights the beast and the ten horns which is the prophetic typology of the ten toes. This is him coming at the end of the sixth seal. This is that battle. This is Ezekiel 39 war. This is, this is uh, um, uh, in second Esdras. This is the innumerable multitude coming to get him. But he's going to destroy them. It's the exact same thing. And what we were talking about earlier in Zechariah 14, when now another battle is coming, that one is the one that we were talking about connected to Jeremiah 35 and that second 70 for Jerusalem 14 years later, when the 13 years are over, the 70th year is done. And then what happens? Now he's coming to tread the grapes, just like Zechariah, uh, uh, Jeremiah uh, 25. When that 70 years is over, to tread the wine press of the waste rate of the wait to tread the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and now it's all uppercase, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. This is the Jeremiah four, uh, uh, the Zechariah 14, whereas the Ezekiel 39 is the Revelation 17. And what is it to the stories right here? This one right here is the Ezekiel 39, is the Daniel 2, is the Revelation 17. He's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. And that is also why it's Revelation 14. And he, my son, will reprove the assembled nations for their ungodliness. This was symbolized by the storm. Verse 39, second Esdras of chapter 13. And as for you seeing him gather to himself another multitude that was peaceable, listen to this, these are the ten tribes which were led away from their own land in the days of the captivity of King Hosea, whom Shulamanser, king of the Assyrians, led captive. Okay? What is the prophetic picture here? Who are the ten tribes, brothers and sisters? That's the house of Israel. The house of Israel. So once he's on this place prepared and built, he's ready to receive them. He's standing on Mount Zion, having delivered them. I mean, uh, uh, having destroyed the enemy. He's now Revelation 19. He's standing on heavenly Mount Zion with 144,000. And they're going to help the group who were like the John the Baptist to that, that renewed the families, the fathers, the sons, the mothers, the daughters back together. And the great multitude of the 10 tribes is coming in. Who are they, guys? Who are the ten tribes? They're the house of Israel. Who did Jesus come to save? But the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Hello. Why during the time of King Hosea? Because the book of Hosea is written to the Gentiles. Remember, the, the house of Israel is spread throughout the whole earth. And they are mingled in with the Gentiles. Remember the Gentiles are grafted into the house of Israel. This is why we're not going by, by Nisan anymore. Because that time is over when Christ first came. Now it's going to be all related to the timing of 
beginning the year count from Tishri. But when this group comes in, they're coming in at the time of Nisan. Just like he came to save them at Nisan and the world, yes, but he came for the house of the, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, he said. And he saved them at Nisan in the death and resurrection. Yes, he saved us all, all who would come to him. Do you realize that this is the last of those who will come to him of the house of Israel, of the grafted in Gentiles with the house of Israel? This is the end of seals. They're, the house of Israel's time is over. How do you get it? They're the final of the lost sheep. It'll probably be like 1.2 billion something people of which maybe a few hundred million or so died, but the majority will still be alive. Some will not taste of death, go in the great multitude rapture, alive. They're the ones holding branches and the ones who have died are the ones who received robes and were told to wait. The dead and the alive in Christ. Where? They're not part of the resurrection. These guys are going where? Well, they're not going to the same place as this group. In, in verse 29, when the Most High delivered those who were on the earth, they're going to one place. This group here, when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion for the great multitude rapture, they're going to another place. We'll talk about that. You're going to see it. Most of you guys that, are, that have been around for a bit, you know exactly what it is. It's the story of, of uh, 2 Corinthians. Chapter 12, you guys all know it, right? And we're going to reveal that also through different Apocrypha pieces. But this only takes you to the end of seals. Well, look what happens next. Then he's told that, you know, go take another three days. Listen to what he says. Uh, let's go to verse 58, the end of chapter 13. And it says, and because he governs the times, and whatever things come to pass in their seasons, and I stayed three more days. So remember, it was seven, and then it was seven, so it was like the seven easy, then he has the seven of seals. Now, he's told three more days. Do you know what that does? Do you know in our end time picture? That was just That just brought us to the end of seals, and now he's told, Go sleep three more days. So three days completed, and then come see me. He would come to see him on the fourth day. So complete three days, and then come and see me. What, it, what is it a prophetic picture of? Just like the seven were the seven years picture of seals, when he was shown what would happen during the seven years of seals, now he's told three days to come after three days, which means he's coming now in the 11th year, which would be like, say, Ten and a half years in approximately, right? Or three and a half days in, sometime on the fourth day. Let's prove that out. So now he's told three more days. So let's go to chapter 14 and listen to what it says. Oh, and on the third day, while I was sitting under the oak, behold, I heard a voice come to me out of the bush opposite me and said, Ezra, Ezra. Okay, but remember with that, he stayed there three days. And now look what happens. In verse 15, he says, lay to one side the thoughts that are most grievous to you and hasten to escape from these times. Okay, who's going to escape when this seven is gone and this three? So sometime in that after that third day. So he's like, he's pre-warning. What happens that we know of in the 11th year? This is when Satan's cast down. This is now going to be Matthew's mid-trib discourse of the seven years of trumpets, and this is when Satan is now cast down. When the pit is open, Antichrist comes back, and false prophet is there again. All three of them are there, and it's called the worst time that it will ever be in human history, and it won't be any worse than that ever in human history again. So listen to what it says. For evils far worse than those which I have now shown you. So there was evils that were crazy bad because it was the time of Antichrist and false prophet during mid-seals. And that was the time worse than it's ever been on the earth until that time. But just like Matthew's discourse says, when mid-trumpets comes and Satan is cast down and the pit is open and the son of perdition comes out of the pit and, 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 and false prophet comes back from his hiding, now all three of them are there. It now says it'll be a time worse than it ever was in all of history 
and ever shall be. Meaning it's going to be even worse than it was during seals. And listen to what it says. For even uh, for evils worse than those which you have now seen happen shall be done hereafter. For the weaker the world becomes through old age, the more shall evils be multiplied upon among its inhabitants. He's literally being told that at mid-trumpets, when the pit is open, it'll be even worse than what he was shown it would be at the time of mid-seals. You see what I'm saying, guys? You see how incredibly mind-blowing this is? Do you even see that it said that he should escape this time and hasten to escape from these times? Do you know why that's so fitting? Because at mid-trumpets right here, at the 10-and-a-half-year point, in the midst of the fourth year of, of trumpets, when Satan is cast down, do you know what point that is? It's, I'll show you two of them. It's Revelation chapter 12, verse 14 for one. I'll show it to you right here. When the woman flies away on the wings of a great eagle into the wilderness to a place where she has prepared, where she's going to be nourished for a time and times and half a time, which means she's going to only, she's not going to be taken just till the end of the 13th year, but this group is going to be escaped or, or removed and taken out of here until the end of the 14 years. What was he told? That you should escape from this time. Where else do we see it? Check it out. You guys all know where I'm going. Psalms 90, an old favorite. Psalms 90, verse 10. For the days of our years are 70 years. There's that 70 starting it again, right? And if by reason of strength, they're 80. So there's 10 years. So from 70 to 80, there's 10 years. So from 70 years coming to an end, right? 70. And then the very next day from 70 is the beginning of 71. That's 10 years, 70 to 80. Yet is their strength labor and sorrow meaning if you can endure those 10 years it's labor and sorrow and what does labor and sorrow mean affliction wickedness trouble sorrow it's 10 years of tribulation and then it says for it is soon cut off which is give or take a few months so you've got about 10 and a half years well isn't that amazing what does it work out to Ten and a half years, approximately. Ten years and a few months into the fourth year is about ten and a half years. And what does it say? And we fly away. This is not pre-trib. This is Revelation 12, 14. What was he telling them right here? The exact same thing. Hasten to escape from these times. Because this is going to be a time worse than it was than all these other things I've showed you before. Told you guys, when you have the revelation of the Gospels, the open books, the revelation of the years, everything opens up to you. Let's go to the next one. Watch this. Let me make sure I'm, I'm, I'm keeping my, my act in order here. Oh, yeah, this was another good one, right? This one I was going to connect to you as well with 2nd um, with, uh, Esdras. So remember at the beginning, when the Most High will deliver those who are on the earth. So this is the pre-trib, as I said, right? So here's another little one. This is a fun one, and I haven't talked about it in a little while. In uh, Acts 15, and if you'll notice, Acts has 28 chapters. You'll see a prophetic picture from 1 to 14 and 15 to 18 in the typology within chapters to years. And look at what we read. It's given to us here. Starting in verse 14, Simeon hath declared. Now, remember, Simeon is in um, in Luke chapter 2, okay, at the, the 40 days of the Son of Man. It's almost as if Simeon is a prophetic picture of Polycarp, okay? It, it seems like it's that typology because Simeon, if you go to Luke chapter 2, it's the, it's the time of the 40 days of the Son of Man and where they're coming to an end. And we see Simeon, okay? Uh, 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 
the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost, listen to this, that he should not see death before. Okay, so he will see death. But that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. When is he seeing him? In the 40 days. And just like Polycarp, once he has and that portion's done, it would appear that he's now going to die. You see? Like this prophetic picture of Polycarp with Simeon. And so when we go to Acts chapter 15, we're seeing the past tense conversation of Simeon. And it says, Simeon hath declared, past tense, right? How God at the first did visit the Gentiles. So Simeon, even remember, the bride goes at the beginning of the 50 days. The pre-trib Gentiles are taken at the beginning of the 50 days. So Simeon is still there until the time frame of the end of those 50 days with the Holy Ghost. So Simeon declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. See? When the Most High will deliver those who are on the earth, it is from among the Gentiles a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets. Exactly. After this, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof. What do we know he does at the end of seals and the beginning of trumpet starts? He's going to rebuild the city and the streets of the temple. And the residue of men, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called. Well, how about that? The great multitude rapture when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion and the great multitude rapture comes in and then the rebuilding of the city and the streets and the temple in the first half of trumpets takes place. You see what happens when you realize it's 14 years and not seven? Everything explodes into revelation. Every part and piece becomes so much more clear. All right, second Baruch, baby. Second Baruch, here we are. Now watch this. Second Baruch is very similar to second Ezra's. Not the same, but it is similar and has a lot of the same stuff. But listen to what it says. We're in second Baruch. Now the chapters and stuff are very different. They're very short, you see? Like there's chapter 26. It has one verse. Okay, so it, it's the it, how it's set up is, is different. But you'll be able to follow anyways. It says, um, you will also be preserved until that time, until that sign which the Most High will bring about for the inhabitants of the earth at the end of days. Therefore, this will be the sign when horrors seize the inhabitants of the earth. Okay? There's the first sign. When horrors sees the inhabitants of the earth. Well, let's go see that. What did it say in Luke 21? Where are we? Starting in verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. And upon the earth, distress of nations. Remember this? With perplexity. You see? The pre-trib is gone, but what is the thing that's freaking them out? They're seeing something coming. The seas and the waves roaring. These are those who were left, the whole world that's caught off guard now in the snare. Listen to this. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the or upon the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. What does it say? When horrors seize the inhabitants of the earth and they fall into many tribulations okay then the tribulation begins moreover they will fall into great torments and because of their great tribulations it will happen that they will say in their thoughts the mighty one 
no longer remembers the earth. How many people already say that? How many people already say, oh, God, look at, look at what the earth is like already. God's already forgotten us. Imagine what they're going to say when tribulation breaks out. In the midst of a great revival, it will only be hundreds of millions and eventually, uh, you know, 1.2, I believe, billion and change. I don't know the exact number, right? It's, it's a multitude no one can count. And so um, the, the rest, though, what about everybody else? What about the rest of the billions of people? You see, most don't go. And when they lose hope, it will happen that then the time will awake. That the coming tribulation will... It, oh, oh so, so let's be clear on this. So what portion of time is this talking about? It's in the above portion. It's not even the start of the 14 years yet. Okay, it's just in that above 50 days portion that this horror and stuff is seizing taking place. So then it says uh, in 26, one, only one verse that that coming tribulation, will it last a long time and that distress? Will it embrace many years? <clears throat> and then he says that time is divided into 12 parts. Each part is reserved for its appointed task. The first part <clears throat> shall be the beginning of commotions. The second part, the slaughtering of the great. The third part, the fall of many into death. The fourth, the sending of the sword. The fifth, uh, famine and withholding of rain. The sixth, we, there was no document for it. The seventh part, earthquakes and terrors. Listen to the eighth part. Okay? So it's like you've got seals and trumpets coming now. Listen to the eighth part. A multitude of phantoms and the attacks of demons. Sound like the opening of the pit at mid trumpets to you? The fall of fire, the rape and much a uh, rape and much oppression, injustice and uncha and, and, and unchastity, disorder arising from a culmination of everything which has been previously mentioned. And then he says, for these parts of that time are reserved and will be mixed with one another, and they will minister to each other. For some of these parts will withhold a portion of themselves while taking parts from others. Meaning, as you've often heard me say, the end of the first six years of seals, it's not because it's one year of seals, one, one seal, second year, next seal, third seal, next year. No, there's going to, there's white horse rider will come, will do his thing, it'll be over. The red horse rider will start. The red horse rider will continue through. The, the, then the third seal will start. The fourth seal will start. They will be mixed over together. One will come to an end, and then another one will continue, and another one will start. That's what this is saying. Okay, it's just not one, two, three, four, five, six. It's not like that. The one will start, then another, and then they will overlap and so forth. Um, and some of the portion others. Uh, hence, those who live on the earth in those days will not understand that this is the end of times. But at that time, whoever understands will be wise. Now listen to this. For the measure and the calculation of that time is two parts a week of seven weeks. Two parts a week of seven weeks. I don't understand how this confused people. Two parts a week of seven weeks. What is this talking about? Let me show you. Remember this? What is this? These are the seven years of a jubilee count, which means this is the 49th year, <clears throat> and this is why we have the word jubilee year here, because it was seven years, seven years, seven years, seven years, seven of the easy, and the 50 days are the last portion of the first seven of the 21, or in this longer count. Then you have the seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets. The seven years of seals and the seven years of trumpets are the last two seven weeks of years of the 49. We can prove this. All we have to do is go to Leviticus chapter 25, and you're going to see how this plays out. You see, a jubilee is what? Seven Sabbaths of years, seven times seven years. When the seven times seventh year is done, which goes to what? Well, it goes from Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets. Because on the 10th day of the seventh month is when the trumpet is sounded, which means the 49th year 
the 49th year in a seven Sabbath of years count to the final Jubilee, it is an extra 10 days longer to get to atonement. You're going to want to remember this because as we go into these apocryphas, all these things that I'm telling you about, they're connected the whole way through. So what do we see? We see that the final 49th year from trumpets to trumpets will have an additional 10 days, and which is to the day of atonement. And then the trumpet is sounded and it's the proclamation of liberty, which is the Jubilee year. Which means the final two sevens of tribulation, and like it said, <clears throat> are called what? Two parts a week of seven. So they're the last two parts of seven weeks. It's the revelation of 14 years. <laughs> it's so awesome. Let's keep going. Uh, da -da 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 -da, let's see. For it is good to man to know and, uh, unless he fall. That's the scary part, right? Is it good? Uh, it is good for a man to come and see those times, but it is far better for him not to come to those times lest he fall. Hello. Don't we already know that's the that's the case? We already know that's the case in, in the trumpets portion, right? And then he says, um, is it only one place? Uh, uh, sorry. Is it only... Is it in only one place or in only one part of the earth where these things will come to pass? Or will it be experienced by the whole earth? And he says, whatever happens at that time will befall the whole earth. Okay, that's what Luke 21 is telling you. Everybody caught off guard? It's going to take hold of the whole earth. And it will happen when everything which should come to pass in those parts has been accomplished that the anointed one will begin to be revealed. Now listen to this. And Bohemoth will be revealed from its place, and Leviathan will rise from the sea. These two great monsters, which I created in the fifth day of creation. Who is Bohemoth? The one that comes out of the earth. Who is Leviathan? One that comes out of the sea. Two great monsters which he created on the fifth day. You want to see who they are? Let me show you. Remember, this is seals. Watch this. Revelation chapter 13. Who is the beast? That comes what? Out of the sea. The first beast, the, that antichrist beast, he's Leviathan. He is the one out of the sea. Who's the second beast? The one that we would say is the Antichrist, uh, uh, the false prophet, right? Who, who, who brings forward and says, everybody worship the first beast. What does it say? And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth. One out of the sea, one out of the earth. Those two great monsters from the sea and from the earth that the Lord created in the fifth day of creation why does that matter to us for anybody that's been following for a little while remember what we were saying there's the first group in the spirit they were witness to the lord coming for his 40 days as light and what did it begin day one two three four five six to chat the to the first verse of chapter two of genesis those seven days were to the Lord as days. But if man in the in the dimension of time was there looking at it, those seven days would have been 7,000 years. It's exactly what, what uh, uh, Peter is telling us in 2 Peter 3, 8. So these are seven days to the Lord, but to us would be as a 1,000 years. And then when you go to chapter 2, you have the creation of the flesh. Remember, that was the third portion with Christ as Adam. Then you have the creation of flesh. And when flesh was created, what was that? It was the beginning of the 7,000 that we're in now. And so we're in the dimension of time now. It is 7,000 years, but to the Lord, it's still like seven days. 
So what did it say in 2 Peter 3, 8? A day is with the Lord as a thousand years. Well, that's Genesis 1. The seven days is a day to the Lord, but would be thousands of years each to us. And comma and it says it reverses it. A thousand years, which now began at the flesh, is as a day to the Lord. Because we're now living in the thousands, yet to the Lord, it's still seven days. So what do we have a picture of? We have a picture of the above, which represents Luke portion and the pre-group and a, and a portion that remains to be witness to the light and to work for him. And then you've got the days. And in these days, what is it? It's the seven days which are to us would have been like 7,000 years. And in the end of days, what do they represent? The seven years of seals. Days, years, thousands. And then you go to chapter two and the thousands begin, yet to the father, they still represent as days in heaven. And in the end, day, end of days, what are they? They're the seven years of trumpets. Days, thousands, seven years. Seven days, 7,000, seven years in the end. 7,000, seven days of the Lord, seven years to the second half of tribulation. So if the days represent Mark's discourse time and the Antichrist with the, the beast and the false prophet, and he said they were created when? He said they were created in the fifth day. Well, how about that? Because that would mean if they were created in the fifth day, that if this is the above portion, which was the first 7,000, but only represented as, as two verses, as the above is Luke's portion, and these were the seven days that to us would be like 7,000, and these are the 7,000 which were in, which would be like seven days to the Lord, then that means this is the time of the Antichrist and false prophet. They were part of the creation of days. Isn't that amazing? This kind of stuff will just blow your mind the whole way through you continue to study these things. <laughs> it's craziness. All right. Uh, and now listen to this. And it will happen at that time that the storehouse of manna will again descend from on high. Which means during the time of seals, is when the manna will come from on high again. Which means, according to this, during the time of seals here, is when the manna is going to come from on high. Well, in the revelation of the 14 years to the seven churches, when do we see the manna coming? Do you realize this is the 50 days portion through to seals? There's mid seals. Okay, this is when they flee into the wilderness in Mark's discourse. And Thyatira represents the dark ages to the end of the six years of seals while they're still in the wilderness. Well, let's go have a read and see where the manna is talked about in the seven churches. Not in Ephesus, not in Smyrna, not in Pergamum. Oh, it's in Pergamum. So Pergamum, that represents when Antichrist gets his power by Satan. What does it represent? Listen to what it says. For Pergamum, Revelation 2.17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written. Where does that equal, guys? Mark's discourse when they flee into the wilderness at the time of Revelation 13, the mark of the beast, which is connected to the one from the sea and the one from the earth who was created in the midst of the days, which represents Mark's portion. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I can never get over this, guys. <laughs> it's just. It's too it's too good. It's just so awesome. Now, let's keep going. And it will come to pass in uh, in Second Baruch, and it will come, uh, and it will happen after these things, 
when the time of the anointed's appearance has been fulfilled. Now listen to this. That he will return with glory? Wait a second. And it will happen after these things when the time of the anointed one's appearance has been fulfilled. So there's been an appearance of his that has been fulfilled. That he will return with glory? Didn't we just explain that there is one of the appearances, which is when he comes at the end of seals, the sixth year of seals, and everybody's freaking out? One, the anointed one's appearance has been fulfilled, which means he's got to be cut off and come again for him to return with glory. When the time of the anointed one's appearance has been fulfilled, that he will return, meaning had to have left, which is exactly what happens at mid trumpets when the pit is open. Messiah is cut off. So he's going to return again with glory. When he's cut off, it's after the city and the street was rebuilt in the temple. Remember, he was on Mount Zion when he came the first time, the mountain carved without hand. That's the end of seals. That's why Revelation 14, uh, uh, 14 he's on Mount Zion with the 144. The city and the street will be rebuilt in the temple. <coughs> Then all who have fallen asleep in hope will rise. Uh, 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 in hope with him will rise. You following? Here is them saying when this, when the, all these things have been fulfilled, these things have happened after these things are done. He says. Uh, when the anointed one's appearance has been fulfilled, which this is the, the time of the end of the sixth year of seals ones, while he's here during the first half of trumpets, then, I mean, of, of yeah, at the end of seals to the first half of trumpets, then he's cut off, which is the only way he can return again, but this time with glory. And when he returns with glory, then all who have fallen asleep in hope of him will rise. That's exactly what happens. When he returns at the end of the 13 years to that 14th year of trumpets. And he destroys the enemy in that treading of the grapes. When he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. Then those who were asleep in him who were what? Promised the millennial reign. And those who had put their necks on the line. Who were the workers during the seals portion. That first group with them. That 14er group with Polycarp, that those were prepared in advance, that when he came and all this began, they were ready. Who have fallen asleep in hope of him will rise. Told you guys. Just as it's been revealed in the Gospels, in the Scriptures, we can prove it out within these mysteries that have confounded people forever in the Apocryphus. Now listen to this. Hear, O Israel, where I shall speak to you and give ear, O Jacob, and I shall instruct, instruct you. Uh, do not forget Zion. Remember Jerusalem's anguish. For behold, the days are coming when everything which will become the prey of corruption. Okay? When everything will become a prey of corruption. Um. Verse 32, uh, da, 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 I shall protect you in the time in which the mighty one shall shake the entire creation. This is pre. Remember, he's going to shake everything. And then what does it say? For after a short time, the building of Zion shall be shaken. So what does that mean? Well, right now they're in the land, right? So Jerusalem and the city and the streets, people are there. Well, now what's going to happen? It says, uh, uh, for a short time, the building of Zion will be shaken in order that it might be rebuilt. What do we know happens at the beginning of the 14 years? Jerusalem is attacked. At the beginning of the 50 days, it's Haifa and Tel Aviv. 
at the end of 50 days, at the beginning of the 14 years, at True Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows, that will be the attack on Jerusalem if it's 2024. And whatever year it will be, it'll be Feast of Trumpets. The first or the second of history. Okay? So what's going to happen? There's that shaking of it so that it can be rebuilt. <clears throat> now listen, but that building will not remain. So what do we know is going to happen? At the end of seals to the first half of trumpets, they're going to rebuild the city and the streets and the temple, just like we talked about. That's when the Lord is here, before he's cut off at mid-trumpets. So, but that building that, that's going to get rebuilt, it's not going to remain. But after a time, it will again be uprooted and remain desolate for a time. What is this? Mid-trumpets. When Satan is cast down, the pit is open. And it's, it's uh, uh, Matthew's discourse where the cutting off, right, that it's going to be worse, like 2nd Ezra said, right? It'll be worse than all these things that I'd already shown you. Now this mid-trumpets time is going to be worse. This is where it will again be uprooted and remain desolate for a time. That's mid-trumpets till the end of the 13 years of trumpets, two and a half years that Satan's going to have. And afterwards, it is necessary for it to be renewed in glory and be perfected unto eternity. Hello. <clears throat> Why? Because when it's all over and Satan is bound, it gets rebuilt and renewed into glory. Just like we re just like we hear in Isaiah, uh, what is it, 65? In Isaiah 65, when everything gets renewed and and Ezekiel 47, and, and the water flows out and everything is renewed and restored. See, New Jerusalem doesn't come down till the end of the millennial reign. The Lord is going to renew everything in that beginning, of, in that jubilee year after he's destroyed the enemy. So listen to what it says. So we understand this. There's only one way to understand this prophetically, and it's the 14 years. Therefore, we should not <clears throat> be so distressed. Now listen to this. Therefore, we should not be so distressed about the evil which has now come. So even in our day and age, in his day and age, we shouldn't be so distressed about the evil that we're having to deal with. <laughs> but listen to what he says. But much more distressed about what is yet to be. Uh, you think? But much more distressed? I mean, we, we shouldn't be distressed. We're supposed to be with the Lord, but could you imagine even knowing what we're going to know when the understanding is made known and we're Holy Spirit filled with the power and the authority greater than Acts chapter, uh, greater than Acts the first time in what we call Acts 2.0 this time to be renewed or what does it say? Uh, but much more distress about what is yet to be. I would say, guys, try not to be too distressed about it. All right. Don't let that uh, consume because you have to understand the entire purpose of this is the salvation of souls. Without great distress, there is no great salvation. Happens all the time, doesn't it? Why was there the greatest revival to that point in the, in the 40s going into the 50s? Because of World War II. Why was there a bit of a revival outbreak for a few weeks after 9-11? That's how it works, where they have no choice but to cry out to the Lord. That's why the greatest revival in human history will happen in the midst of tribulation. Now listen to what it says. For when the mighty one renews his creation, there will be a trial greater. Remember, when it's all over, there's going to be a great trial, right? The just and the unjust and, and those, it's going to be worse, right? Let me show it to you. Uh, um, for when the mighty one renews his creation, there will be a trial greater. You know what it sounds to me like? It sounds like Daniel chapter 12. Talking about the end of tribulation and the final year. And at that time, Michael shall stand up the great prince, uh, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble uh, such as was never since there was a nation even to the same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered 
everyone that shall be written in the book. Now listen to this. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, what you guys don't know is I've been doing more study. I spent the whole afternoon before planning for this video. I meant to be planning for this video, and I got totally sidetracked because of a question uh, in relation to Daniel. I'm going to show you more understanding to this timing that goes from Daniel 11. It's fascinating. This is the end. This is that seventh final year. This distress that's coming is that craziness that is now going to come about in the judgment, this time that is going to be worse even for everybody. Not that it's the enemy and everything else, but it's the time of judgment. Some to everlasting wake and the rest to contempt and shame. Right? Not a fun time. But now listen to what it says. This is the best part. For when the mighty one renews his creation, there will be a trial greater than these two tribulations, these two tribulations, kind of matching like the two sets of weeks of seven weeks, 14 years, tribulation of seals, tribulation of trumpets, seven and seven. How awesome is that, right, guys? Just incredible. Absolutely astonishing, astounding. It's all there. Excuse me. It's all there. And we revealed these things from Scripture. We revealed these things from Scripture first, guys. All right? Let me see. The second Baruch. These two tribulations. I think that's all I was going to do. Passed on away forever coming. Carried into perdition by it. I'm debating, was there one more I wanted to see? Because there was something else. I think that's okay, though. Okay. All right. So now, let's continue this forward. Oh, see, so why was why did I have that with 2nd Baruch? In 2nd Baruch. Was it the rebuilding, renew? Might renew his creation. Or was it down here? When we return his glory, those that fall asleep will rise. Yeah, let me see. With those that will fall asleep and will rise. No, it had to do with, oh, that's what it was. It was just, I was going to add, in relation to two weeks of seven weeks. Okay, so now you've seen what I mean by that with the two weeks of seven weeks. It's two sets of seven years and we know that this final year is a year and 10 days and it can only be in a seven times seven only in the 49th year okay there was the seven 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 first then the seven easy that we're in we're in the seventh year now i believe and then seven years of seals seven years of trumpets only the 49th year which is our 14th year in the end of days is it a year and 10 days long Okay, that's what we were talking about in um, in Leviticus when we went to chapter 25, okay? That's what we were showing in Leviticus. And it's important to understand. This is why, again, when you go into even Matthew 24, and we saw how in Matthew 24, that only out of the three discourses going from Luke to Mark to Matthew, only Matthew 24 which is immediately after that tribulation. So you see, in Luke's, remember there was two tribulations? In in Sorry, in Mark's, it says, um, uh, what was it? Uh, after the tribulation of those days. That was the first tribulation. And this one says, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Okay? It's different from the one in Mark because there are two tribulations. You see, this is what Baruch is telling us. It's clear there are two sevens. There are two tribulations. And what do we see in Matthew? It's not only at the coming of the Son of Man that it's the day and hour, but it's the only one that talks about it being as the days of Noah. And so what do we know about this? We know that the Lord has now come at the very end of the 13th, or you can say like Zechariah 14, 
He's now come at the beginning of the 14 years. It's the day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance. And Matthew chapter 24 is telling us that this year is like the days of Noah. Okay, we've taught on this. What are the days of Noah? Well, when we go to Genesis chapter 7, we see in Genesis chapter 7 that it says it was the second month, 17th day of the month. Okay, and the 40 days and all this stuff start. This is now because many of you that have been following for a while, you know, Genesis 7 into 8 is a prophetic picture giving us the overall story of the above in 14 years, but it is also a prophetic picture of the final year of tribulation, which is that 14th year. And it begins on the second month, 17th day of the month. When you come to Genesis 8, when now all the flood and everything is dried off off the earth, we're now told that it's the second month, 27th day, which means it was one year and 10 days. This was important to connect with Leviticus 25 because only the final Jubilee year or the 49th year that then announces the Jubilee goes from Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets like every other year because now we're talking Judah. And on the 10th day of the seventh month, which means 10 days later, the trumpet of the Jubilee is sounded. So the only book that has in its discourse the mention of the days of Noah, which we've been able to reveal is perfectly connected to the 14th final year of tribulation, which is the judgment of the Lord on everybody now, the final year of the judgment, the day of the Lord, which is the year of his wrath, Zechariah 14. We can now see it's a year and 10 days long, exactly like Noah's story was. Exactly like Noah's story, which is exactly the way it's supposed to be in the final 49th year with an additional 10 days to then sounding the trumpet of the Jubilee. It's it. This is the stuff, guys. Piece by piece, over and over and over. Everything proves out. Everything reveals it. It's all over the place. So now let's look at Didich. In Didich, let's go to right here. This is why I was leading you into that. So it, it wasn't, it was a little bit connected because that was two set, two tribulations, seven and seven years, right? Now listen to this. We're in the book of Didich, the, uh, the Apocrypha of Didich. We shared this a while back in chapter 16. Watch over your life, see? Watch in, in parentheses. Why? You see? It's, it's the watchman. Watch over your life. Listen to this. Do not let your lamps be quenched. Do not let your loins be ungirded, but be ready. Listen to this. For you know not the hour. <laughs> you see, we're starting to come full circle now, aren't we? Who is that? Who is he talking to right there at the beginning for the end of days? He's talking to the group of watchmen who are prepared before he comes. Like the other 14thers, we are the 14ers, a group prepared of watchmen before he comes who are being given the revelation of the end of days in the open books. What did he say to them? Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning so that you're not what? For the good man of the house, had he known at what hour? You see? In, in Luke 12, 40. Be therefore ready also, for the Son of Man comes at an hour when you know not. This is him talking to that first watch group, that disciple group. They will know the day, but not the hour. That's why Luke 21, verse 34, 35, when it said, so that that day doesn't come upon you unawares. You see, why does it say that day? Because those who aren't caught up in the things of this world, that have separated themselves from the things of this world, who are the ready and watching, you see, ready, girded, lights burning, watchmen, they will know the day. We know the day, but we don't know what hour in that day. That's Didich. That's just that first part of Didich. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. 
uh, for you know not the hour which the Lord comes, but be frequently gathered together, seeking the things which are profitable for your souls, for the whole time of your faith will not profit you, except you be found perfect in the last time. For in the last days, the false prophets and the corruptors will be multiplied, and the sheep will be turned into wolves. The love will change to hate, and love will change to hate. For as lawlessness increases, they will hate one another. Exactly. That's what we were talking about, right? And persecute and betray you. This is the same group he's talking about during the 40 days. And the deceiver of the world will appear as the son of God. You see, the Antichrist. And he will do. Let's go to the next one. And he will do signs and wonders. And the earth will be given over into his hands. And he will commit iniquities which have never been seen since the world began. Hello. How about we go to Mark's discourse and look at what he does in seals. Remember what it says? Antichrist comes. There's the abomination of desolation. This is the mark of the beast time. When they're going to flee into the wilderness. The group that's going to receive the manna. And what does he say? In Mark 13, verse 19, for in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation, which God created unto this time. This is the day's creation. These, You see why Jesus is coming to shed his light and why he came for his light of the house of Israel and why this group is going to go and shed that light is because he's coming to save the group that represents the creation of days when everybody was made, that group of males and females were made in the image which was light. Craziness. You see, look at the difference when you go to Matthews. So it said, see, which God created unto this time, neither shall be. Watch this. Matthew 24 is different. This is... Mark of the beast, antichrist, false prophet time. In Matthews, it's when the pit is open, antichrist comes back, false prophet is out of hiding again, and Satan is there. And listen to what this one says. Uh, do, 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 do. Where is it? I passed it. All right. Mark, uh, uh, Matthew 24, 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. You see, it's, it's exactly what we were reading about in, uh, in Second Esdras. Those things that I had shown you, how terrible, it was so bad. But now what I'm going to show you at mid-trumpets and what's coming, you're going to want to escape from, like those who are going to flee into the wilderness at the ten and a half year mark. Because now it's going to be even worse than the worst that already was from mid-seals. Craziness. Now listen to this. Um, then the creation of mankind will come to the fiery trial and many will be offended uh, and be lost. But they who endure in their faith will be saved by the, cur uh, uh, by the curse itself, and then shall appear. Now listen to this. I used to think at first that this was like a pre, mid, and post picture. Listen to what it says. And then will appear the signs of the truth. So this, is, this isn't this is pre. These guys were pre. Then the Antichrist comes, and he's coming twice. And now it's coming, and it says, and then will the signs, then will appear the signs of the truth. Okay, listen to this. First, the signs spread out in the sky. Well, ready for this? Watch this. Matthew chapter 24. The coming of the Son of Man. What does it say? And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. Do you know that if you go into the other discourses? I don't believe it says that. Let's see. In Luke, listen to this. And the stars... Of heaven shall fall and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. You see, no sign. No sign. Only Matthew 24 is the one that says a sign. This, by the way, is the sign of Jonah from Matthew, right? 
So there's the abomination. Okay, so the sign. What did it say? It said, first one is the sign spread out in the sky. Then the sign of the sound of the trumpet. Well, what do we see next? Matthew 24, 31. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. What do we see next? Thirdly, listen to this. Thirdly, the resurrection of the dead. Thirdly, the resurrection of the dead. So what happens? The sign of the Son of Man coming at the end of 13 years or to start the 14th year. <clears throat> then you've got the sound of the trumpet, which is exactly, by the way, which is exactly what Revelation chapter 10 tells us, that the mystery is going to be over. The mystery of God should be finished in the days when the seventh angel begins to sound. The mystery is over. So you've got the sign as Jonah, the three days and three nights. Then you have the, the blowing of the trumpet. And then you have the resurrection, it says. The resurrection of the dead. Listen to this. But not all of the dead. But not all of the dead. Of course, not all of the dead, right? But as it was said, the Lord will come and all his holy ones with him. Then the world will see the Lord coming on the clouds of heaven. Okay, let's go back to Matthew. We've heard, we have the sign in Matthew 24. We have the trumpet. We know the resurrection of the dead. That happens when the Lord returns in the final year. Let's see if we have this other one when he's coming on the clouds. Because in Luke, it's in a singular cloud. The word on means in. In Mark, it means, it says, on the clouds, plural, but the word on means in. Only in Matthew's discourse does the word in actually mean on. Okay, sorry. Luke and Mark both say in, and it means in. Only in Matthew does the word in actually mean the word on, and it's different than the one in Luke and Mark. So this is when he's on the clouds, when the trumpet is blown, when the sign is seen, <clears throat> and then some that are resurrected because it's the time of the resurrection of the just. Do you know when you go into the resurrection story in the end time prophetic order, Luke, Mark, Matthew, in the Synoptic Gospels, only this is why those differences are so powerful. Only in Matthew's resurrection story do you see the bodies of the saints that arose from sleep. Go read the resurrection story of the Synoptic Gospels. Go to Luke's, go to Mark's, and then go to Matthew's. Because the resurrection story of Luke, Mark, Matthew, which we have in our intro teachings, <coughs> also give us a prophetic picture of the Lord coming to begin his 40 days at the start in the above. It's a prophetic picture of his coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. And it's the prophetic picture of his coming at the end of the 13th year or the start of the 14th year. And when he comes, it's the sounding of the trumpet. It's his sign in the sky. Um, uh, it's the resurrection from the dead. And he's on the clouds. Only Matthew's resurrection story do we have where the graves opened up and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose? Do you know why, brothers and sisters? If you're new to the ministry, it's called the revelation of the Gospels. It's the, it's the Gospels revealed, and they are in order in the end of days. The last will be first. The first will be last. Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end is Luke, Mark, and Matthew, pre, mid, and post. This is the prophetic picture of post when he comes at the end of 13 to start that 14th year, feet down on the Mount of Olives. He's seen coming on the clouds as one end unto the other. It's his sign first. It's at the trumpet blast when all will be made known. And who gets to rise? Some of the dead. Who are the ones of the dead? Kind of like we were saying near the beginning. It's the ones who put their necks on the line, the ones who were the Smyrna, the ones who were... The 14ers, that first group who was prepared even before he came, who were ready and watching and understood the season and times of his coming. 
They were the ones that will take part in the first resurrection, exactly as Polycarp said. Polycarp is a part of that group, but he wasn't given the understanding that these guys were given, but he was still a part of that group. It's like other watchmen around the earth. They might be part of the, the, the worker group, but there was only one group that was given the revelation. Crazy, right? Full circle, brothers and sisters, right to seeing the time of their resurrection. Everything always in order. It's, it's unbelievable. It, it, it just goes over the top over and over and over again. Now we're almost done. Let's start bringing this home. Where are the fragments? Did I forget to? <clears throat> oh, no, that's the fragments. Hey, watch this. This one is another Apocrypha. This one is called uh, The Fragments. I think it's uh, something about the, uh, um, uh, what is it, Church Father Fragments or something like that. And listen to what it says. As the elders say, then those who are deemed worthy of an abode in heaven will go there. Remember earlier I was telling you to, re to remember what you saw like in 2nd Ezra's? The first group, the, the, the Holy One, right? The Father came and took out a, a, a people for his name from among the Gentiles. And then when he came again and, and Jesus comes on heavenly Mount Zion, right? The mountain carved without hand and, and the, the ten tribes representing the house of Israel, right? With the Gentiles grafted in, that's the great multitude. I said they're going to different places. Here's the Apocrypha that confirms it with Scripture. As the elders say, then those who are deemed worthy of an abode in heaven will go there. Others will enjoy the delights of paradise, and others will possess the splendor of the city. Third heaven, paradise, the city, which is the millennial reign, uh, uh, Jerusalem, the Lord reigning in Jerusalem. For everywhere, the Savior will be seen according as they will be worthy. So even though he's going to be here for the millennial reign, those who are in paradise <coughs> will still see him as if he's there. Those who are in the third heaven, We'll still see him and interact with him as, he, as if he's there, because he is. Isn't that crazy? He will be in all places, always at once, no matter what. Hard for us to wrap our minds around that, really, isn't it? <clears throat> now, listen to what it says. Those who will be deemed worthy who see him. But, uh, uh, but that there is this distinction between the habitation of those who produce a hundredfold and those uh, and that of those who produce 60-fold, and that of those who produce 30-fold. For the first will be taken into the heavens, the second class will dwell in paradise, and the last will inhabit the city. Well, how about that? Do you know what that sounds like? For anybody that's been around for a while, you know exactly what it means. Even the new people probably know this one. It's where the whole revelation after the Gospels began to be revealed in September of 2017. It was late September and I think even into October, then that the 14 years started to reveal itself. And it began right here when I realized Luke, Mark, Matthew, pre, mid, and post were all true. We see right here the prophetic typology in Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in 2. I knew a man in Christ. Who are the ones in Christ? They're the spirit-filled Romans chapter one in Christ spirit-filled above. This is that 50 days, the above 14 years. Those in Christ spirit-filled, that's the pre-trib that the Lord God takes out first. That's what second Ezra was telling us. That's what the fragments are telling us. This first group and where do they go? They're like a rapture, like a harpazo, which is the word rapture in English. They're like a rapture, and where do they go? They're the ones, just like the fragment also said, that are going to heaven, or more specifically, the third heaven. People say, oh, this is just Paul. These are Paul and the experiences. Yes, it was Paul and his experiences, but you have to look detailed at the wording because the first one was in Christ. You're going to try and tell me that the second one in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 3, and I knew such a man? which means this one wasn't in Christ like the first one. It was like a man, kind of like the first one. Well, the first one was in Christ. Those who didn't go pre-trib and are part of the great multitude rapture, 
they're not the ones that were really in Christ, but they end up kind of, you know, they give themselves over in, in the time when now it's do or die. And this is where they can simply say they believe in Christ and, and bang, they would get to go to paradise. Well, look at what it says. This group, which represents the great multitude rapture, how that he was caught up to paradise. This is Revelation 12, 5, was caught up into paradise. You realize this is exactly, this is exactly what the fragments, which were thousands of years, a couple thousand or plus years old, this is exactly what they're saying. These are all fragments. These are all writings. These are all books that we're going to, that the Essenes had, that they put in Qumran in these, in these jars. That we've been able to reveal through the mysteries of the prophets and the Psalms and the law. To bring about the mysteries of the revelation of the end of days. To be a group of 14ers prepared and ready. And all of these hidden books that have been revealed the last 70, 75 years are all proving the same things out. So what about the third one? Well, listen to what he says. You come down to verse 14. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you. Well, how about that? First one, a taking to the third heaven. The second one, a taking to paradise, which is the place prepared that when I return, I will receive you unto myself, that there I am, there you shall be also. And what did he come with? He came with the, the mountain carved without hand that became a great, the stone carved without hand that became a great mountain. He came with paradise prepared for them. That's the great multitude rapture going to paradise. But the third one, he's coming to them. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's coming to them. It was a taking, a taking, and the third one, him coming to them. And he tells now, he's talking to Judah. He says, in the third time, I am ready to come to you. And I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. You see, he's already taken all the children. You see, the Gentiles went first. They were the most, you know, didn't really have these understandings that have been taught for thousands of years that Jews have passed down. That the house of Israel were a part of, but then they mixed with the Gentiles. So they were the part to paradise. But the Jews had these things still passed down generation after generation. That's why you guys are last. You see, remember, the flesh is the third portion. It was the spirit, the light, and the flesh. Well, it just so happens we're all living in their portion, which is the flesh. But we are spirit and light, or we're light. So the first group is spirit, light, and flesh. The second group is the light and the flesh. But some of them have to be reminded to be given that light. Just like in the pre, we might have some of the light, but... The spirit has to be awakened in us. And when you have the spirit, the light, and you're living in the flesh, you're the first group. The second group going to paradise, which is the days, is the light group. They have to be awakened to the light that's in them. And they're the ones who are going to be going in the great multitude rapture. You see, they're, they're the light group. He's coming to shed his light on them. And they're the final ones, the lost sheep. And then what? Well, we're all living in the time of flesh. So what did he do? He dealt with taking care of the spirit group, then the light group. And now he's coming to them because we're living in their portion of flesh of 7,000. And in their portion of flesh, he took care of the others first because during this entire 6,000 years of flesh before the millennial reign, it was all theirs. We were in their time. This is why we've been praying for them. This is why you're to pray for the Jews. This is why you're to lift them up. This is why the Lord blinded them for us. Of course, there's still salvation coming for them. The third time he's coming for them. And he's not bringing any more burden. He saved them for last because we are in their dimension of time in the flesh. They had to be lost. Craziness, right? Awesome, awesome, awesomeness. All right, let's bring this sucker home. In the book of Gad. Oh, did I? Yeah, I do. 
All right. In the book of Gad, this one's an easy one. It's only going to be chapter 14. We're going to go to the book of Gad. The book of Gad in the portion of the Great Tribulation. And look at what it starts. Rosh Hashanah. In the first day of the seventh month at New Year's. Well, lo and behold, isn't that precisely what we've been sharing for so long now? When is it all going to start? When do the 14 years after the above portion? It starts at Rosh Hashanah. When the six years are over at the 29th of Elul, the seventh year begins of seals, Rosh Hashanah. When is the Lord coming? At the end of the six year of seals, the day and hour, no one knows. That's why it says in Mark's discourse. Then you've got the seventh year of seals. Then you've got trumpets tribulation beginning, the seven years of trumpets. And when the six years of trumpets or the end of 13 years are done, the Lord is coming on the day and hour no one knows in Matthew, which is Rosh Hashanah, Feast of Trumpets. And when he comes at Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, it'll be as Matthew's. Remember? It'll be Matthew's as it was in the days of Noah. Which means that final year is going to be as it was in the days of Noah. And when that final year is over, which if it is in the time frame of years counting that we've been showing, would take us to Feast of Trumpets 2037 to essentially Feast of Trumpets 2038 for that final year, that final year as it was with Noah. Well, if the final year is the year of Noah, then that means the final year to 2038 is an additional 10 days from Tishri, which brings it to Yom Kippur, which would be the sounding of the Jubilee trumpet Proving out that the final year is a year and 10 days for Noah's representation. And at atonement of that final year is the sounding of the Jubilee. A year and 10 days. Is that not correct? Have we not been able to show these things? Well, let's see. Are you ready for this? Watch this. Three chairs on the right side, four on the left. I believe this has to do with the seven churches. Um, now listen to this. Here it comes. The books. Verse 7. Uh, and the man dressed in linen brought before the glory of the Lord three books that contained the records of every man. He read the first book, and it contained the just deeds of his people. And the Lord said, you see three books again. And the Lord said, these are granted eternal life. Okay, like the first group. And Satan said, who are these guilty people? And the man dressed in linen cried to Satan like a ram's horn saying, silence, this day is holy to our Lord. And he read the second book and it contained the unintentional sins of his people. And the Lord said, listen to this, listen to this. Put that book aside and save it until the third of the month passes by to see what we will do. <laughs> and he read the third book, and it contained the wicked deeds of his people. And the Lord said to Satan, these are your share. Take them and do what you want with them. And Satan took the wicked to the wasteland and destroyed them there. And the man dressed in linen cried at the ram's horn, saying, blessed are the people who know the joyful shout, O Lord, who walk in the light of your countenance. What happened here? What is this a picture of? This is the end of tribulation. And this picture of the end of tribulation at Rosh Hashanah, which is like we're talking about here, we're talking about being at the start, uh, uh, sorry, at the end of this year, okay? Right at the end of the 14 years. What is the end of 14 years? It's the 29th of Elul, and then Rosh Hashanah is that end of 14 years. But remember, that final year had an additional what? 10 days. It had 10 days, didn't it not? That final year has an extra 10 days. So what's happening? It goes from it's happening at the Feast of Trumpets, at the New Year, at the end of Tribulation. And what does he tell him? Put that book aside. 
but save it until one third of the month passes by to see what we will do. What is one third of the month, brothers and sisters? 10 days. 10 days. What is he saying to put it aside until? He's saying from Rosh Hashanah to the Feast of Atonement, 10 days later to the Jubilee, let's see if during those 10 days they will atone. How do we know? Because look at what it says next. Now it's the millennial reign. Brothers and sisters, I hope this blesses you and excites you as much as it does me. We just went through a ton of things, but specifically seven portions of seven different apocryphas or seven different apocryphas and portions in them to reveal things that we have revealed throughout the years, clearly understood in the scriptures, taken to the apocryphas, proving out exactly what we had been proving in the scriptures without one single glitch, no hiccup, no, no misstep, no nothing. Every part and piece in order. And brothers and sisters, I hope you realized that it begins with a group just like us. Just like you and me. A group of watchmen separated from the church and the world, even though you may attend, you know things that have never been understood until this time. That are the evidence that the time of the end can shortly begin. Because it needed to take place before the end can begin. And every one of you listening and taking part in these revelations are all a part of it. The original ones, brothers and sisters, before the Christians were 14ers. Do you know how crazy that is? Do you realize how crazy that is? And this is the pre into the 14ers. And this is the time of Christians. This is when the persecution of Mark's portion, which is the Christian church. But 14ers came first. Man, oh man. We are blessed. We have been chosen. I can't tell you why. It is all in the Lord's will and in his hands. Just remain strong. Join us in the forum. If you're new, you can go to ministryrevealed.com. Go into the menu. Click on the forum. It'll take you a few seconds to sign up. It's free. Join 1,200 people from around the world sharing prayers and requests and, 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 and Bible studies and all sorts of things going on in there. And meet like-minded believers from all over the world. It's glorious. God is good. We have done nothing to deserve it, but we can prove that it's happening. Brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. And we'll talk to you all very soon. Bye for now.